Hi, this is Russ McClay, and this is another Dow Lodge podcast. Among the podcasts that I have been doing have been a series that have been dedicated to stories of how I found the Ranch Book. Now, the Ranch Book, if you don't know what it is, is a spiritual teaching. It's spelled U-R-A-N-T-I-A, the Ranch Book. You can look it up on the net. And what we're going to uh, do in this podcast is uh, talk with someone who has uh, a long experience with the Ranch Book and uh, learn something about how they found it and how it's influenced their lives. And um, so we're very happy uh, and pleased to have with us uh, tonight, my time here in Taipei, Taiwan, uh, David R. Clearwaters. So, so, David, how are you doing? Good, Russ. How are you? I'm doing really good. I'm very happy that uh, we could uh, do this uh, in spite of the time zones. <laughs> me too. Me too. By the way, the middle uh, initial R stands for Ray. <laughs> okay. That's my and wife. Clearwaters is not American Indian. It's German. Okay. My mom was full-blooded German, and my dad was part Dutch, but mainly German. So, Well, I, I think a lot of people may have wanted to know about the Clearwater part. And the R part, uh, yeah, my wife's name is Ray. Uh, it's also ah. a, a Chinese word, is Ray. That, and her name, is, <laughs> she's Chinese, so yeah. Her name is So Ray Ling. So. Oh, <laughs> okay. that's nice. So, so um, David, uh, as I know, you're up in Oregon, right? Yes. Okay. And I, I guess we'll just start this off. Uh, you know, we don't like these things to go on too long, so uh, how, how can you tell a great story in, in such a limited time? But we're going to try. But maybe you could start off. Just um, you know, tell us a little about yourself, your childhood. Okay. Well, I wasn't uh, born in Oregon. I was born in uh, Pasadena, California. And my mom... Uh, had asthma real bad, and the doctor told her she should uh, move out of the smog ridden southern Oregon, uh, southern California area. And uh, she had a sister, uh, my aunt Helen, who had moved up to Oregon near here. And so my dad bought a piece of property here uh, outside of Grants Pass on the Applegate River. It was uh, 40 acres of timber, and the property, uh, the house on it was a was a shack. Wow. And he uh, he rebuilt it. And uh, we moved in in 1952. Wow! And uh, the house had no uh, plumbing. There was there was running water, but we had no no phone, no no TV. Uh, there was an outhouse outside, and we were we were very poor. I didn't know it. I mean, to me, it was just a normal fare. Right. But they started a, a chicken uh, an egg ranch. Wow! And uh, we had uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of hens, and that was a wow chore uh, <laughs> I had. Yeah, there's a lot of stories about that. I had a lot of a lot of egg fights in there. I'll tell you with my friend, <laughs> <laughs> much to my parents' chagrin. <laughs> but uh, anyway, my my parents were very harmonious. They never cussed. Well, I think I heard my parents swear once when a, a pack of dogs got in the in the chicken house there. <laughs> oh yeah. And they never they didn't drink. They didn't smoke. There was nothing but harmony in our house. I you know I I, uh, I we had a, a little country church. It was kind of a Baptist, non-denominational, but it was Baptist. And uh, my dad was not as religious as my mom, uh, and we would always go there uh, on Sundays and so forth. And I kind of went along with it and kind of kind of felt that the spirit of Jesus, I guess you could call it, but at a camp, at a Bible camp, I accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. Uh, how old were and you, I got, uh, David? I was about six, okay. maybe seven. Okay. Around like that, something and like what that. What was the? Uh, I mean, did you feel deeply about this experience, or was it something everybody else was doing? It was more like a call, you know, how they tell you if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell and all of that. Right. And I just accepted this premise that they were portraying, and I did feel this warm emotional glow, uh-huh. and I felt really good. Wow. And I can remember walking outside the house and uh, just walking on air, but it only lasted, you know, a few days and it was gone. That's pretty amazing. And I just couldn't, for, I couldn't figure that out. Yeah. So, anyway, uh, we were like, I, like I say, I was I was born in Southern Oregon, so I really didn't fit in here in the uh, rough Oregon environment, and I got the snot beat out of me all the time. Oh. And I couldn't fight back. I found I just didn't have it within me. I, I, when I would conf- be confronted with with hate 
or anything like that, I was completely paralyzed because I was an only child. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have any of that experience at all. Mm-hmm. And I was just, it was totally foreign to me, and I was like a fish out of water. I didn't know how to act or how to even respond. Mm-hmm. So I didn't do anything. Mm-hmm. So this went on for a while, and uh, I ended up hating this guy. I ended up literally just, it was burning me up inside, because this guy, you know, was making my life miserable. Like the, the school bully. Uh-huh. Yes, exactly. And, I, you know, and it was just, uh, I remember laying there in bed, Russ, and just thinking, this is not good. This is, this is destroying me. And then I remembered what the, they said in Sunday school, that Jesus said to pray for your enemies. Wow. And so, well, I got nothing to lose. So the guy's name was Ronnie. And I remember, I remember, seriously, I remember laying there saying, you know, God, that Ronnie, God, when he gets down into hell, but you can leave a leg on for me. Don't tear all his limbs off. You can leave one leg on. Yeah, and I felt a little bad at it. And the next night, I said, leave two legs on. You know? And then the next night, go ahead and leave an arm on. Yeah, really? And I go, you know what? This works. This works. I feel a lot better now. And I started cultivating that. But the problem I had, the real problem I had, was getting down on my knees every night and praying for forgiveness for my sins. I just couldn't quite get this blood thing. It just, I don't know, there's just something wrong about it. And I can remember thinking, you know, I don't, I love Jesus. I don't want him to be responsible for my foolishness. So I finally went to one of the deacons in the church. And I said, no, listen, how does this work? I'm, I'm cussing today, praying for forgiveness, and Jesus died on the cross 2,000 years ago. He said, well, it's retroactive. I go, what? He said, yeah, every time you sin today, Jesus' shoulders sag just a little bit more 2,000 years ago. And I go, that, that sucks. I, I like the guy. I, I, you know, I don't want to be responsible for any pain uh, that I do, you know, that has to suffer for. Sure. This whole business, so I, I gave it up. And I thought, there goes my, I'm done. I'm going to hell, you know. Well, can I, you, uh, David, uh, you mentioned this blood thing. What did you mean by that? The shedding of blood for the remission of sin. But, I mean, physically? So, I mean, what teaching? There's no, no church this that was teaches the Baptist, that. Uh, the Baptist, uh, the ba- that's, that's sort of the whole Christian uh, theology, is that we are born into sin and are basically uh, unworthy and are like almost like orphans right, because right. of what happened you know, okay, back okay. there in Genesis. Original right? And sin. the only way original sin, and the only way that God can see us as being pure, and it all relates to the, to the Jewish practice of sacrificing. Right, right. And sure. Paul's idea of adapting it to the Jewish race by sure. saying, look, you don't have to go to the Sadducees anymore and sacrifice a lamb. Jesus did it for you. He's the Lamb of God. Right, right, Which right. I worked, you know, it worked. The Spirit of Jesus worked through all this. Okay, now... That's what amazes me. Right. Now, you were saying at a, at a certain point now, you're still only, what, six or seven years old? No, no. This was probably when I was about ten. Okay. What happened was... Well, wait I now. Gone... Let's, let's say I want to get you back on where you were, which, uh, All right. was, which was where you were saying that you, uh, at some point you repudiated uh, religion at that point, or, or what? Or you said enough I didn't of that... Repu- the only thing I repudiated was the practice of asking forgiveness for my sins okay. uh, as per the, uh, the uh, crucifixion. Okay, that's where we were. Yes. And about that time, uh, might have been a little bit before, when I was starting junior high, a, a Christian school opened up here in, in rural Oregon here. And uh, I started the first year there, and a bunch this this school was good they still you know were were involved in in the baptist uh, philosophy but there was a moral fiber there that was that was undeniable i mean these it was rough i mean we played the soccer out there on a rock field we'd come in just bloody i mean it was rough we were we were it <laughs> Tough was guys. rugged yeah and there was you know the rooms weren't heated it was all just this uh, rural environment and everything well anyway to make a long story short, the more the uh, well, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's why we're doing this. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I, 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 being there reinforced my worry about this, this relationship with God not 
being quite on that they're portraying. There's just something not right here. I just couldn't put my finger on it, so I was in a quandary. Well, my senior year, three of us decided to bail and go to, to Grants Pass High and play football. We wanted to play football. Well, we joined up, and we were good, and we were fast, and we were strong. That year, uh, the Grants Pass High, uh, football team went to state, took state, swept the, swept the, the, whole, uh, the whole, whole state. Mm. Our pictures were not in the photo. I, uh, my, my whole game time was to get down in my stance at, right at the end of the game, and then the whistle blew at the end of the game. Afterwards, the line uh, coach, who was an ex-Marine drill sergeant, came up to me, Mr. Stevens, and he walked up to me. This is the last practice. He walked up to me and he says, man, you Christian boys are tough. <laughs> he says, I did everything in my power to drum you out of this corps. I went, why? I thought this was normal stuff. I knew it was hard, but is that why all this went down? <laughs> there is a huge good old boy network in this town. And I saw it, and I said, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, not kind of, I'm leaving this town. I'm leaving Oregon even. You know, this is just beyond, I can't handle, you know, I just can't fit in here. What, so, about, your, what about your buddies? Uh, same thing. Well, they, uh, my one friend, Roger, i got to tell you about him. He, uh, he walked, uh, I got into radios, I should say, about this time. Uh, sitting around the stove in the winter, it was boring, dull, rainy. Couldn't go outside for days, nothing. Just My dad and I would crack peanuts there behind the stove, you know. And it got so boring, I would say, listen, Dad, instead of us just cracking these peanuts and eating them, let's crack the peanuts all at once, save them up, and then eat them all at once. I mean, that's how it was. And it's so like after we ate them, I went, this doesn't work. I'd rather crack them and eat them. It's much better if you crack them and eat them instead of store them up. You know? <laughs> well, one day I went over to my cousin's house, who, uh, you know, my aunt was, uh, was nearby, and they had hooked up a transformer to a car radio that normally runs on D.C. They'd bypass the vibrator. And they had it all hooked up, and, you know, car radios are, are very good radios. They, they have nice reception. And I was enthralled. I saw something there. I said, well, man, there's something. I can." And I got on the radio, uh, went to dumps, got parts and stuff, got on a ham radio, got my ticket, built my own transmitter, and got an electronics full bore. All right, so here I am in the house at my little bench in my room, sitting on the radio. Roger comes in, New Hope but Christian schoolmate. He comes in. He's standing there looking at me perplexed. And he says, you're going to get your ass kicked. I was a nerd. I'm looking at him and say, I already have had my ass kicked. What are you talking about? He says, I'm going to help you. I'm going to teach you how to Indian wrestle. He says, get up. I said, well, what are you talking about? Take off your shirt. He says, here's how this works. We're going to hit each other as hard as we can. Uh, no, no hits above the neck allowed, nothing below the belt. And we started in. And he taught me how to box. And we boxed and boxed, and there's a lot of funny stories. I won't, the, 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 what happened was we were boxing around by the egg room when we were in college, I think. It, no, no, this was in high school. And he was quicker than I was, but I was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I ended up faking to, to his right, swinging with my, my right. He blocked it with his, uh, his uh, left arm, and I broke it. Oh, oh. Snapped it. <laughs> oh, man. And his mom said, no more. Yeah. So that was the end of that. But, uh, Never got into a fight. I've never hit an, a man in anger. Uh, well, there's several chances it could have happened, but it never happened. Roger and I, we were like a pist two pistons, you know, and it was like if uh, we'd have ever gotten involved in a fight, we'd have cleaned up. It never happened. Came close time or two, but it never happened. So yes. mm -hmm. then came uh, college. College. He and I went and played football there, and we probably could have been professional players, because I, I ended up getting sick. I'm 6'9". 6'9"? Six, nine. Six, nine? Like, yeah. And I, was, I got out of Vietnam because of that. <laughs> they tried to draft me, and I was just... Jesus, yeah, I stood bad. On, and I stood on a scale. And I was clear off, the, clear off the scale. And the guy says, holy, how tall are you? And I'm 7 foot 10, sir. <laughs> they laughed all the way down behind me in their shorts, you know. And the guy wrote, said, You're, you, you dug a fox, if you dig a foxhole, somebody else jumps into it. You're, they can't get out. He says, here... Sign this waiver. I remember <laughs> holding that waiver in my hand, Russ. Wow. I could, you know, I could just sign and go to Vietnam. You know, right. That's what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so anyway, so we, we played football there, but afterwards it was so animalish. 
I love team. I love sports uh, only because of Roger. I love teamwork more than sports. Mm-hmm. I hated sports. Uh, mm-hmm. I hated sweating. I hated until Roger got me going and got me into that groove. Mm-hmm. But boy, we love football. But hated the animalistic. Anyway, we that didn't go anywhere. I graduated. Uh, but before I graduated, <clears throat> the second year. All this time, by the way, uh, they were drumming my love for electronics out of me. I ended uh, who, up hating electronics when I got who, out of who college. Who was? The sports was? No, the curriculum. Oh. They made it dry, boring, dull. Now, wait a minute. This, a, is, this is college you're talking about? This is college electronics. Oh, yeah. I see. And the way they were teaching it wasn't jiving with you. Well, they, they made it into a dry thing where I saw the beauty of it. Uh-huh. And they killed my love for it. Oh, to give you an idea, how it was hard. Out of 250 original freshmen, only 17 made it through. Mm. It was a hard, rough. I mean, there was a bleeding Indian, a dying Indian on the common steps the day I started. It was a rough town. Football players, uh, our Chinese lineman, our big guard, he come in just all black and blue one one practice. Wow, well, rough, rough neighborhood. <laughs> oh, man, I could tell you. There's stories there. I won't go into that. But we, uh, what happened? Oh, I went to the wrong bar. You know, it was horribly tough. But you know what? There was no fear like there's sort of in the, around the edges today. There wasn't any fear. It was really a, a, a wild time. Well, anyway, I, I wasn't having any luck with girls. I was scared of them. <clears throat> I, I, I just, you know, it was, it was awful. And then I saw this girl walk by. And it was Rose, tall Rose, six foot, redhead, green eyes. Wow, black six foot. O'Connor. <laughs> yeah, O'Connor, but not a, a, a harsh bone in her body. You'd think she'd be have a temper, no temper. We hit it off. I had a gang. They they railroaded me into being the president of First North, which was uh, part of the dormitory there. And I told them, you guys don't want me to be your president. I'm telling you. Well, I started a gang, and the gang was to do pranks. And they never caught us. My roommate was about 5'4". He wore braces. He, uh, all these guys would just have a, 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 a gang of pranksters. And it was, they were so good, all the other uh, halls would claim, uh, claim credit. Uh, for example, um, we had fire alarms in there. And uh, they'd be pulled occasionally for fun. And I would, I would have a beer or two, and I'd say, I want to see Rose. And one of the guys would go, run, pull you on. I'd go out in there row, sitting there in her curlers, and we'd talk for a <laughs> No kidding. The, guy, the gang was powerful. Well, they put this spray on these uh, pole handles of indelible ink where, you know, you could see it under a black light or whatever. Mm. So we, the guys down at the end of the, the hall there, were old. They're like 30. They were almost as old as we were. <laughs> no, I'm saying they were older than we were by quite a ways, you know. And it didn't seem like uh, that's such a stretch now, but back then it was immense. Right. So anyway, we took some fish hooks hooked them on the, uh, the handle and run a line over their door because they got up early. And when they got up, everybody got up. So that's the kind of stuff we did. Water fights. I mean, I could go on and well, on and where on. Do you, uh, where do you think that comes from uh, in your nature, this prank? Uh, rebellious. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a rebel. I, I'm not a conformist. I don't like clocks. I don't like being told what to do. I don't like, uh, how would you say, um, Authority. Uh, uh, right. authority. I was. I was. I was going to say that was the word that was coming to mind, like anti-authoritarian. You know. Yeah, man's authority. I right. did not think one man but, had but, the. Uh, yeah, but but I mean, your friends aren't really representative authority, I and mean, usually pranks are kind of played on your friends, right? Oh yeah, but mainly this was played on, on people in general. You okay. Know, it was like okay. well, we I would wanna, dump a. I don't want to we would dump it. a bag of snakes and lizards and, and bats into the girls' section of the dormitory. Okay. You know, I, Rose was in it. on that. One. I've d- I've done it. So, okay. <laughs> so anyhow. I still do it. <laughs> so okay. well, Rose Rose kept hanging around as my buddy, and uh, every time she'd walk up, they'd all clam up and say, "Oh, here's Rosebud." No, uh, I'd say, "Look, she's going to be a member of our gang, so don't clam up anymore." And she became a literal member of my gang. So. That was some of the best times, the best loyalty, the best, you know, just camaraderie, just raw, raucous mm, fun. Mm. Okay, I graduated from college. I hated electronics. I started work down here at the lumber mill, went back home, pulling green chain. That lasted a couple of months, and I'm going, this this is, this, you know, I, I realized I had a ticket, electronics ticket. Rose was working up at Oregon Caves. 
she uh, she she was into uh, into financing and accountants. To give you an idea about what happened at that college, we were walking late in my last year, and the dean of men was standing at the steps coming down out of the administration building, and he saw us, and he says, Rose, are you coming back next year? And she says, I don't think so, because, you know, we're, we're probably going to get married. And uh, he said to me, uh, Clearwaters, are you, are you coming back? And I said, no way. He says, thank God. <laughs> 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 we never got caught. <laughs> anyway, so I, uh, I, I had a friend. Rose and I had a mutual friend called, uh, by the name of Rod Ralston. And uh, we'd hit it off. He was kind of a loner, <clears throat> kind of a uh, a recluse. Uh, he's also into electronics, and he was really into uh, audio. <clears throat> Excuse me. He uh, really, really was into uh, speakers and, and music. And I was more into RF radio. So that I kind of we got together, and uh, he went down with me. We, uh, I took a break from work, went down and to uh, the Bay Area, walked into Hewlett Packard, took their test, aced it, and hired me right off the street. Went down there, married Rose, and started to work for Hewlett Packard. Loved the place. I was in heaven. I mean, we called the place Gandalf's house, you know, mm. from from uh, sure. from the Lord of the Rings, sure. and it was just, it was just. Where was, I was that? In, in Palo Alto, Bay Area, working for. Uh, oh, okay. Was, and uh, we, I, I lived right down from the hill. All oh, their stories there, I could tell you. Oh man! What, uh, what time frame are we talking about here? This was 1967. Okay. That's the year Rose and I got married. And then uh, we, I worked there for a while and ran into, a, I always run into these problems. My morality runs counter to, I, I, this is before I even ran into the Arantia book. Mm -hmm. I had this sense of morality. I, I had rejected the, 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 the salvation plan, but I still, I hung on to the morality of it. Yeah. A, a lot of my friends rejected God altogether. Now, no, no, I'm not doing that. You know, I love Jesus, that spirit thing. I love that deal with Jesus, that did, sweetness. Did you, uh, okay, uh, David, like at this time, uh, it sounds like you you, know, you found something you really loved, uh, Hewlett Packard, yeah. uh, a new environment, different and stuff, but were you like reading anything or doing any uh, formal praying or any no, kind of... No, none. No, weren't going like to that? church, nothing, okay. no, nothing. Okay. Uh, I was writing. I was I was always been a I loved to write. What well, were you writing? writing? You writing stories or? Yeah, just short stories, science mm -hmm. fiction. I love science fiction. Okay. I was trying to you know I wrote a bunch of okay. science fiction stories and this and that. And okay, I was but you had my... this, but you had this morality thing that was really plagued pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, it stuck out like well that's what got me in trouble with Hugh Packard. Oh. Um, yeah, I, it's just kind of a long story, but basically what happened was <laughs> it all had to do with with run times. Where people were cheating, oh, uh -huh. they were marking boards as good to to to, to do on a rework schedule to increase their run time. And I wouldn't do it. Mm. I wouldn't stamp a known. It came down to stuff like this. I wouldn't stamp a known good, a known bad board with my stamp saying it was okay. Mm. I could not do it. I wouldn't do it. Right. And I, I got <laughs> uh, before long. Everyone's making a lot more money, and I got bitter. And we bailed. I just one day said, "That's it." You know, and here again, it was like this faith thing. It was like I had no job. I had no, you know, I had a family. We're still, we had already had a, a girl, Becky, our oldest. And we just packed up and left, came back to Oregon. Walked into uh, a couple of places and was offered a job at uh, Channel 5. I became a, uh, an engineer, a broadcast engineer for a while. And uh, we uh, ended up. Uh, renting and I wasn't going back to Grants Pass. No way, Jose. Uh-uh. Nope. Not that town. Uh-uh. <laughs> Wild bulls couldn't drag me back. So we ended up moving way up in the hills in Weimar, which is above Rogue River, way up in the hills. Wow. On a dead end road called Sykes Creek. At the wow. end of Sykes Creek was a nudist camp. Okay. Mm. So one day the board operator came to visit us and he happened to see this one gate that was up the way that said the Brotherhood of Man Retreat. And he says, let's go. I went, no, I don't, we, don't, you know, we can't just go in there. He said, yeah, let's go, let's go visit these people. I think it's a hippie commune. Oh, hippie commune, huh? You know, this well, was, uh, let me stop you right there, David. What did you think of hippies at that point? I was fascinated by them. When we had gone down there to uh, Hewlett Packard, we stayed in uh, this, another story. Stayed in the Grand Central Park. What's the park there? That that main park in San Francisco. 
and we just slept on the ground there. There's a whole, and I saw them, you know, saw them on Haight Ashbury Street or what, you know, they weren't really hippies. They were Golden, in that, Golden that. Gate Park. Golden Gate Park. There's another story there about tour buses coming up and seeing us laying there, and, call, and they said, look, you've come all this way from Japan. Here are the hippies you've been coming with. What are hippies? <laughs> we were, you know, we had blogging clothes on. <laughs> we didn't even know what they were. But I was fascinated by the phenomenon. So we got up there, and here was this a commune. And my friend says, I walked up to the gate, and there was a little phone there, and we rang it and rang it, and nothing. He says, well, I'm going in. I went, what are you, you don't know what, he says, come on. All right, so we go in there, and here was Don Hendrick, a straddle, a vehicle, just cussing up a blue streak, pounding on this thing at a two-by-four, trying to get the engine into its mount, just pounding and cussing up a storm. And we walked up, and he jumped down his high. And come on in. We walked in. He, he, he wasn't a hippie. I mean, he, he, was, he had short hair. He was neat. He was, uh, uh, you know, uh, articulate. Went on in. And before long, we're talking about religion. Mm. And he hands me this book. Mm. He says, here, read this. Take this. I go, what is it? He says, it's, it's, and he kind of explained it to him. And, and I said, what? The life and teachings of Jesus. How dare anyone? This is from the devil. How oh, dare really? anyone write in? Really? Oh, you yeah. felt that? Oh, felt absolutely. That. Oh. I didn't. The only but, reason but I felt that. But how did you that, just? How did you just flip to that? I mean, it's a big book. Uh, because, uh, uh, well, you know, I looked at the sections of it as he was explaining it to me, uh -huh. and the reason I felt that was because of my the, the training I had now, about the Bible being the only word of God. Sure, sure, sure. So, and here uh, somebody else is writing another. No way. Obviously, from the devil. And um, I knew the Bible very, very well. Right. So I took it home. Okay, hold on just one second. So this is like in this guy's house on a yes. this kind of commune scene? Yes, yes, and up the road from and, where... And, and you never knew this guy? No, we just walked in on him. And so I, he's, and the and he's going, and he, was, he was cursing out uh, his car or something? What was that part? Yeah, he was hammering on his engine that wouldn't fall into the mouth. Oh, so, and then he just says, and, and, and he stops doing that and says, come into my Jump house. Down. Yeah, come on in, you know. And then you're just sitting third. there and... and you're not even sitting there, what, five minutes, and he's showing you this? Pretty much. Wow. Yeah. I okay. mean, we had nothing in common. Okay, so you, this. <laughs> so you freak yeah. out. The life and teachings of Jesus, you freak out, then go on. Take it home. Take the book home. I start reading it. I'm reading it, and it's nothing like I've ever read before. And I can't find anything in the beginning that I can't agree or disagree with, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't uh, jive with the Bible. It's, it's talking about things the Bible doesn't even go into at all. And then when I start getting into the life of Jesus itself, himself, because, you know, the first part's kind of an introduction of what the deal is there. Right. About Emmanuel, you know, just set up for him to come down on his bestowal. Right. And I started reading it, and Russ, I wanted to believe it. Mm. This, I fell in love with Jesus all over again. Wow. I thought, <laughs> man, this is real. This guy, I want to believe this. <laughs> and and it, all of a sudden, I, I thought, wait a minute. See, we Rose and I at this time were looking into uh, so, you know all kinds of different things. Sure. Rosicrucianism, oh, that ontology, time? all that. My stuff. God, this yeah. Then, my God, yeah. Well, I thought there's either got to be a man or money behind this book, <laughs> and I wrote back to Chicago. Oh, yeah. I, I wrote back to Chicago, and they said, "Hey, we're having a conference here. I think it was 1972." Uh, oh, when yeah. this conference was. Oh, I yeah. ran into the book, I think, about 1970, yeah. somewhere around in there. Yeah. Anyway, 1972, 73, they had a conference in Chicago, and I told Rose, I'm going. I'm going. Mm -hmm. Now, we couldn't really afford it. I had my own business at this time, because mm -hmm. I had quit uh, 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 the Channel 5 uh, to start. Now, I'm, let's see, how did this work out? Was it after I'd read the book? Yes, I think it was. I, I was still working for Channel 5 when I found the book. And the book convinced me to, to, to break away and start my own. Anyway, so I took off with uh, a friend that, that lived across the road who'd moved up there. He was, it was Big Dan Christensen. Now, this guy was immense. I mean, he was bigger than I was as far as girth, and, and but I was a taller than he was, but he was an immense man. And we hit it off. And he says, I'm going back east. Let's go. Got in his old wheezy Oldsmobile, and we talk, took off to the west. And that's a whole nother story. We took got off to the east. To the east, I mean. Sorry. Took off to the east. <laughs> See, got I'm to Chicago. A, I'm paying attention. <laughs> Good. Keep me on track. So I'm getting all wound up here. <laughs> it's, it's getting interesting now. So 
Dan didn't have a ticket. He stayed in my, my room. I bought a, a ticket to, you know, to, for the lodging and all that. And, and one of the first things was a lunch. And I thought, okay. And I was at the cafeteria at this college. And I walked in, and here was the president of the Brotherhood, Paul Snyder, punching our lunch tickets. And I'm watching him like a hawk, you know. And his kids, he had two or three kids over in the corner, and they started acting up, just like mine do. And he went over and treated them just like I would. And I'm going, okay, he's no special guy that thinks he's puffed up or anything. So I dismissed the idea temporarily of it being a man. Took my tray, sat down at the table, and here across from me, now get this, Russ, were two little old white-haired ladies. And I said to them, how long have you ladies been into this book? (laughs) <laughs> and they said, we were two of the secretaries that transcribed it. Yeah. I said, what? <laughs> and they told me a little bit about it, and I'm going, you know, I'm starting to get this really funny feeling, like, ooh. And so I walk into the first uh, co- the first meeting, the first uh, gathering. Was, was this on uh, di- at Diversity Parkland? No, no, this was at a college campus. Okay. near In- Right near Michigan, Lake Michigan. Okay. okay. I think that's a proper lake. Mm-hmm. And so uh, at this big auditorium, they were having the first, uh, what they call it, the commencement speech. Well, not the commencement speech, you know, the beginning. Sure. And I uh, sat down, and here, just inadvertent, Big Dan was on my left. We sat down there looking around, all these people and everything. And here was this little old white-haired lady next to me. And she says, hi, uh, do you have any children? And, yeah, I do. It was Julia Fenderson. Oh, yeah. I know Julia. She's the- Oh, man, she took me under her arm, and then Vern strode on stage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he lit the crowd up like a, like a, oh, a Roman candle. Oh, my God. I oh, mean, and, God. Just, and so <laughs> <laughs> I come back to Oregon. I'm on fire. Ju- Julia says to me, you have to start study groups, and it wouldn't be a bad idea if you had a conference. I'm wow. Like, conference? I'm a, I'm a radio guy. I'm not no Monty Hall. <laughs> like what conference? Wow! And so we started our study groups. Wow! And man, did that go? That got hot. I mean, we were. It was wonderful. These these little those meetings up there in the at end of that uh, road up there in that A frame. Oh, they were just like a cozy little fuzzy shoe, you know. Yeah. Well, then when we started these conferences, I was the MC. Rose and I just no money, by the way, through all these things that we've done. I we didn't charge any money, didn't collect any money, refused it. Just we did it all on faith. Rose and I decided, let's try the state Sounds business. like you're a freaking hippie to me. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what they would say up there. They said, you know, Dave and Rose are, 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 would be true hippies if they didn't work eight to five. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> All of them would come to our house to wash, to, to watch TV. Well, actually, to be honest, uh, you know, that, that uh, what you're describing, I'm, I'm going to break in just for a moment, is, uh, uh-huh. you know, the, the idea of, that's a real, you know, the Orange Book talks pretty highly about uh, uh, some of the world's religions, and one of them is Taoism. And in Taoism, there's a real great precept, which is that uh, a lot of the precepts there I really appreciate in Taoism. One is that the uh, uh, that you keep your end of the bargain, but you don't uh, exact your due. It, it's kind of a trust in the system, you know. Uh-huh. And, and when I was saying it's a hippie thing, it's not really a hippie thing. It's actually a Taoist thing, you know. I mean, you were yeah. just, you were just, you know, you were fired up, you know. You wanted to do this thing, and I mean, you didn't care about, you know. I mean, you would invest, oh, no. you would invest everything you have because it was your passion, right? Oh yeah, this was the real deal. I mean, this was the the idea that that you, we have these thought adjusters within us, these fragments from God, and you got the, the Jesus connection and the garden, and all of this stuff. I mean, all the way to paradise. Well, I started yeah. reading the book from the beginning. It took me three years. Yeah. But I read every sentence, and I wouldn't go on until I understood at least a little bit about it. Just an inkling. Gotcha, gotcha. And then when I got that downward view, see, the, the, the air is looking up from the bottom, up towards paradise. That's fraught with distortion and, 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 and trouble, uh, bad view. The view, the perfect view is from down, from down, looking down. Get the view from your rancher book from paradise down. Then lots of stuff clears up. Lots and lots of stuff clears up. Can so anyway, we that? had all these. Can you explain that a little more? Well, it's like if you're looking 
at a light bulb. Mm-hmm. And you're looking at this light bulb, and you, you, you see a phenomenon there that looks like a, a radiate. You know, you, you can come out like if you were uh, not knowledgeable in science, you wouldn't, uh, you couldn't figure out what it was. But if you could look down from the light bulb itself, and you could see the wiring and the little filament and why the electrons running through it are making the filament hot and how it emits photons and because of, you know if you knew okay, all this stuff okay i got it i got it yeah it's a much clearer view of what's taking place right right it's like being so, you know very conscientious and very uh you know just looking a little bit below the surface of everything yeah it's the reason it's the it's the source it's why it's the basic why Mm. So then the why is God and how God operates. I'm telling you, you read this book and concepts lay there dormant. I remember reading the book, and after a while, I decided to go back and read regular material. I picked up a Reader's Digest, and I read three pages, and I think I literally threw it across the room. (laughs) This is pap, shallow. I tried to read a novel. I couldn't read a novel. (laughs) It was so shallow and weak and low. Sure. It didn't excite me at all. Sure. I had to stop reading your answer book for years before I could start reading again. It was Oh, weird. wait a minute. Now that's interesting. What why was that? I don't know. I think it was because my mind was so used to this heavy intellectual fare that it would be like after eating uh, uh you know delicious food and then yeah. suddenly you go back and you're starting harmony and you're going this this tastes like this is terrible. But you yeah, said, that's but, it. But you said that you stopped reading the Arantia book, or did yes, you? Yes, I stopped reading the Arantia book so I could appreciate other writing. Oh, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that peculiar? <laughs> no, no, I understand it. I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> so, uh, Becky, our first daughter, may have given the very first youth uh, uh, study group. I remember in those early days, you're outside, and the whole group of the kids had taken the Arantia book. Uh, some of my kids uh, didn't, uh, most of my kids haven't taken up the Arantia book per se. You know, they, they, it's in there. They're all around. They're always under our feet. They were always around during our meetings. It was, it was a part of our life. So, let's see, what happened then? Oh, then, we were invaded. We got invaded by ontology. They oh. literally moved in and gave, uh, had, a, had each house had a server, one at a time. And they would come and literally do your dishes for you and all this stuff, and all the time pumping you for information. What about so and so? What about such and such? And I'm going, well, the flaw I saw came when one of them was mentioned, Martin, uh, Lord Martin Cecil, the founder of this place, being the father who has come down from heaven and is on earth now. I'm, oh, oh boy, I ran around the whole community. <laughs> These people are not, and oh, Dave, you're so, you know, you, 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 you're judgmental, Dave. You're being judgmental. I'm going, judgmental? No, it's a fact. <laughs> and they ruined marriages. It destroyed. Uh, we had to move away. I said this. It got bad. I mean, now, we wait a minute. I, sorry, uh, you said what was ology? Something ology? Ontology. On. That's what I thought you said. But ontology yes. is a word. It is a word. It's also a, uh, a religious movement. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they have uh, bases in Canada, Colorado, and ontology. it was a big ontology. Lord Incredible. Martin Cecil, Bishop Martin Cecil. Okay, so He's these guys, so these guys, uh, basically ran you out of your uh, where you were living. Oh yeah, you? they destroyed it. I mean, it, it, marriages were destroyed, and finally, I said to Rose, "We got to bail again." Wow, it got bad up there. I mean, we would have meetings in my house. I remember an Easter uh, Urantia meeting where there was almost I don't know if it was fifty or not, but the whole place was full. You had professional pot growers sitting next to cops. You had ex-Jesuit priests arguing with old salts, old retired Navy guys. It was unbelievable. Wow. Cool. Man, <laughs> there was one. And we passed, they did the cup, and it was just, it was, oh, we kept getting invaded. All these outfits kept trying to get us, and ontology got us. And so anyway, uh, that, that, I'm simplifying things here. I started my own business at that time called Davis Calibration Service, and we were making like, you know, $1,500 a, a year. And we're happy <laughs> a year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, yeah. And the faith came in. I got to tell you, we, we tried the faith thing. It works. It'll rattle your cage. It'll drive you right. It's like God wants to every, he squeezes you until you can get every little thing out of you. 
I mean, it just when you're just ready to give up, bang, here it comes. It's un- I've seen it happen over and over and over and over and over. So anyway, sure. yeah. we moved, uh, yeah. we sold our house, $6,000 profit, and um, decided, well, we've got to go somewhere else, you know. And so I'm looking around, looking around, looking around. And guess what happened? <laughs> we ended up building a house right back on the property I left. My folks had that on that 40 acres, right, right. in the middle of it, scraped an open spot, and the inspector came, my dad and I ran him off. <laughs> Uh, rebel again. My dad was a rebel too, a quiet rebel. He also got in trouble with the county, which uh, as you'll, you'll, you'll see, I uh, followed in his footsteps. So we built the house here. Zabriel came and helped actually one time. We were having these, uh, I met Zabriel uh, at, a, at a conference, uh, as per the Arantia book, and we kind of hit it off, and then we drifted away for years and years and years. And anyway, uh, I built this house, uh, my dad and I, and Rod, my partner, we started RC Electronics at that time. Rose, Rod, and I, and we made our Heavenly Father our invisible partner. He is part of our business, and we started out with $100. And didn't have you know much, but by golly, we started repairing stuff. Everything, you name it. We'd repair anything, and it grew, and it grew. We moved into town. We started a guild. We ended up building benches all over the place. I put up KFMJ, a radio station. We had bank contracts. I got a Siskiyou National Radio Force contract for three years. We had a depot in Gold Beach, Radio Shack. Bought a Radio Shack in Gold Beach to support the uh, Forest Service contract. On and on. Grew and grew and grew. All the people in, in there working knew our stance about the Urantia book and our beliefs. It got so big. Don Hendrick, I, at one point I hired every single one of my relatives when the mail order hit, we went to Apple mail order uh, computers, and we hit a big time. Had partners. When the dust cleared, Rose and I were in debt up to our ears. Figure mm. that out. Yeah, yeah. You get the picture. The problem is we were going in wide-eyed. I remember one guy saying, you know, you're playing in a field full of people with, with uh, spiked shoes, pads, helmets, my body armor, everything, and you're running out there with nothing but a pair of shorts on. Yeah, but that's you. You have some background. You were an old football player. Yeah, well, he meant like <laughs> in the business world. Yeah, yeah, I, well, I, yeah, well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got to tell you, some of the times we had down there at that guild, some of the electronic, you know, all these guys are nerds. Most of them are atheists. I mean, to give you an idea of the, the character of some of these people. Uh, one guy would drive up while we're eating dinner, walk into the house unannounced, walk up and, hi, Dave, walk up and start eating off my plate with his fingers. <laughs> and my uh, Rose would look at me in horror, and I said, it's all right, Rose, it's Mike. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, but they're geniuses. These guys are, you know, and I, I learned to get along with them and work with them and everything. And <clears throat> we're just <clears throat> chuckling along, and things went along. And uh, let's see, what happened about the end of the conference? Well, where you were oh, going... David, uh, I don't know if this will help you at all, but you were basically just, you know, listed this uh, this history of, of the way your business was developing. Uh, yes. And all through this, now we're giving conferences every year, you know. And, oh, there's so many stories I could tell about all of this. But go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> tell a favorite story. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you, you have uh, you have too many for one podcast, but feel free to. Uh, well, you could tell a few. I got to tell you, <laughs> I decided on these conferences, the ones I had seen were boring. They were dry. They were dull. They were spiritually sure. exhaust. These were your you would, you would, book, book conferences. Yeah, your Rancho book conferences. You would come away from them exhausted. Yeah, not not in a bad way. You right. know, spiritually exhausted. And I decided, you know what, your rancher readers need. A refreshment. They need, they need to have like a, a, a get together for fun. So I scheduled it, arranged it so that the heavy talks would be in the morning, and at noon we would break and we'd, we'd have fun. We played a, 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 a volleyball championship game between Oregon and California for the Father's Cup. Oh, it was a nice. little wooden cup that the uh, a, a ping pong ball would fit in perfectly. It looked like nice. this little. Nice. Gobble, gobble. You just wonder. Oh, did we, boy, did, did California <laughs> want that, that, that trophy? Did Oregon want oh, that? You talk about banter. You talk about insults. 
That's <laughs> right. Really... You're not hitting the ball right. You got. To... <laughs> oh man. Oh man, that's cool. We had so much fun. It was just wonderful. Dave Strang, David Jesusonian on the, on Facebook. That guy, he come blowing in here from from uh, Illinois, and this guy, I mean, here you had all these hippies. He wore wingtip shoes to give you an idea. You know, you got hippies, and here he walks in to give these talks, and he he's got these elaborate, this incredible intellectual display that's beyond belief, just as serious as pie, and everyone's just taking it all in. <laughs> <laughs> What a picture seeing this guy in a suit standing in front of a whole bunch of hippies laying on the ground. <laughs> it went on and on and on for years. I think it went on for over, over 20. I remember when we passed 21. I think it's the longest running consecutive conference in the Urantia movement. Really? Anyway, it was, oh, yeah. Julie, several, Julie told us the best of all. It wow. was so lighthearted. It wasn't, and we, it, kept, it kept, got bigger and bigger and bigger. Was Anyone it, could give a talk. Was it always in Oregon? Oh yes, always at Indian Mary Park. And where is that? Mary, Mary Park, it's, uh, Indian Mary. Indian uh, Mary uh, Park. Yeah, it's towards Merlin, outside of Grants Pass, along the Rogue River. Okay. There's a river there. It's a big park. Boy, you there's something camp. really special about that area. I, I know it. I know it. I, that's why I was forced back. God literally pushed me back here. I, I you know I didn't want to come back. I mean, how about Gold weird. Gold Hill? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my daughter's uh, fa- uh, father and, and, and mother-in-law live in Gold Hill. Yeah, that's an amazing area all around here. So anyway, we uh, after the uh, the uh, conferences and everything would run, our, our business kept getting bigger and bigger. And uh, the, uh, one thing, things just don't run very smooth here. I went back to Murphy Chapel, and I wasn't going to mention your answer book. I got into the youth movement. King's Teens, it was called. And I started a basketball team. I did not play basketball. I hated basketball. But I was tall. Now, these are kids, 13, 12, you know, that, that age, young, mm-hmm. young men. And we entered the church league under as Murphy Chapel. And I was to give talks to the kids if I was to be the, the youth director. And so I did. And I remember what got me in trouble was quoting uh, Luke... 1721, neither shall they say lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And I expanded on it. I told them, I looked those kids in the eye and I said, God is in you, and their eyes got as big as saucers. I told them in no uncertain terms about it. And afterwards they came up, they all crowded around me and wanted to know more. That preacher grabbed me by the shoulder. There's a guy, my preacher, that, that I grew up under, pulled me into the back cafeteria room. He said, how dare you? I'm like, what? How dare you tell those kids that? Uh. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, that's for the sanctified. That's for people, what you might as well have said, people like me who've been to, you know, seminary school and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, "Uh, Pastor, you better read that passage again. I said, he was, you know who Jesus was talking to when he was, when he told, when he said that? His enemies, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and you won't let me tell that to these kids. He said, you're no longer welcome here. He didn't say that. No, I'm sorry. He said, you can't speak anymore. You're welcome to come, but you can't talk. Mm. Okay. Well, along about that time, I started writing uh, uh, this novel. That I I love science fiction, and I saw possibilities within the Arantia book about spiritual fiction, stories about the adventures of on the other side, without rocket ships, without, you know, laser beams and, and monsters and stuff. Right. No death. No, and so I started writing this. And I ran into another author, and to make a long story short, she found out about the Arantia book, and I introduced it to her, and she had this little, I guess you'd call a metaphysical center, and she asked me if I'd give a talk there. And I said, sure. She ended up, Russ, plastering notices all over town. Man, that's not supposed to happen. That was, you know, supposed to keep this low key. You don't do this kind of thing. I got all nervous about it. One of the members of the church came in one day into my in the in the work, pulled me off the bench. Said, "Man, I'm sure glad you're gonna you're gonna expose that Urantia book for the evil it is." Wow. Uh, what? Yeah. He says, "Yeah, I know Mo Siegel and that guy and blah 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 blah." Man, did he blister Mo? And I kind of knew Mo, and I, you know, I didn't know much about him, but how, you know, for him to blast him like that and call him all these horrible names and all the horrible things he did, I said, "No, wait a minute." You know, 
you can they, one thing he was tacking too many things, Russ. Uh. And so I went on the offensive. And I said, I said, so you're doing the Father's will then? Oh yes. I said exactly. Yes, sir. I said, well, how come you're not? Uh, he had his two boys there. Uh. I said, so you're only punishing the older one. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, when the younger one sins, you don't punish him, right? You only punish the older one. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, that's what God did with Jesus. He punished his older son, the eternal son, they believe, for the sins of all the younger sons. He got all upset, all torqued off, went back, and got me totally kicked out of the church. Oh. We had a, I had a game coming up with these kids. We were in church league playing at, under the Murphy Chapel. I brought a roll of masking tape, sat those kids down, I said, we can't play for the church anymore, but I still want to play. Do you guys? They said, yes. I said, all right. Do we all believe here that we're sons of God? Yes. I said, we are now the sons of God. Had jerseys printed up, and we played for decades in church and city league as the sons of God. That's pretty Again, cool. Again, invaded. Roy Masters. I, I don't know who you know if you know who he is. He had a I team. Do, I do. Roy Masters? Yeah, he's local here. He, uh, he had a team. And they, you know, and no one would play them but us. The Oregonian came down and interviewed our team, asking us, why why are you playing Roy Masters when no one else uh, would? At this time, our Urantia study group had come involved with the Sons of God basketball team. We had people filming it. I had the, one of our uh, main members be the coach of the team. We even had cheerleaders. <laughs> Can you imagine a city league game having cheerleaders? <laughs> The wives and daughters out there, whoopah, whoopah. <laughs> we filmed it, we looked at the films, and we were, and Roy Masters, we told them, we told the Oregonian, we'll play anyone. We'll even play the devil. <laughs> <laughs> the sons of God even will play the devil. I remember that. The Dave yeah. Bauer was our coach. He told them that. Well, the team folded. We drafted some of the players. Uh, uh, three black guys who were good. They were good, quiet, separate from us. And that's when the division happened. The Roy Masters people. There was there was about three white guys, three black guys, and there's another character I invited in. And pretty quick, instead of us going down to the pizza parlor after games and sitting all at one table, there was two separate tables. And I went, uh oh, uh oh. I remember going up one time to get a pitcher of beer, and the other team coming up to me, three or four of them, and saying, "You've got to quit." I'm going, why? You're going to kill somebody out there. You're dangerous. You're an animal. I went back to the table. And I thought, oh, man, I'm playing for the sons of God. I'm going to hurt somebody. Well, we prayed before every game that no one would get hurt. Not that we'd win or whatever, that no one would get hurt. No one ever did. Oh, that's good. Fast forward this about a few years, and I can remember them telling me the same thing. And I'm sitting back at the table going, I'm good. I'm doing good. They're afraid of me, you know. <laughs> I, I couldn't shoot well, but I could uh, I could block and I could intimidate. And... Uh, because of our name and everything, we were and not being the good old boy club, we were we were not like we missed. I almost always fouled out. I mean, I, there's more and more and more stories there. But anyway, what eventually happened <clears throat> is uh, one of the founding members, one of the young boys that I started the team with, called me up one day and says, uh, "Some of the people uh, want to change the name." I went, "Why?" Well, some of them don't believe the same as as, as uh, and I went, "Well, of course not. If God would have wanted everyone to be be the same, He'd only made one." Others. Well, they, 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 they want the name changed. I said, no, they can quit. Well, we're going to have a vote. I went down there, and I looked those guys in the eye, and I said, if you dare vote this, if you dare vote that we, we drop this name, you are in, in a way, and maybe it's not such a small way, you're saying you're not a son of God. They voted it down by one vote. And the vote that threw the, threw the uh, thing was, was my young, the, the, one of the founders. Mm. I was so... Afterwards, when I got in my car, the older black fella come over. They were always chiding me. You know, you should be able to dunk. If you could dunk, we'd win every game. Well, I can't dunk. You know, I, if I if I get over two two or three inches off the ground, my ears start popping. You know, <laughs> you're not a dunker. No, I'm not a dunker. I, I never. I was self taught. I, I can't play ball very well. But, but but we had a lot of fun. I was effective, and it was everyone loved playing with us. We even had the, a Mormon who was the uh, Oh, that's another story. Who is a uh, the, the basketball coach up here at Hidden Valley? My son's coach, 
join our team. And he told me later, he says, he, he played basketball, you know, in, in big, uh, big colleges, professional, well, not professionally, but he was, a, he was a coach. He said, the most fun I've ever had was playing on your team. Can you believe that? The most fun he'd ever had was playing on my little rinky-dink team in town. So they had to vote. He comes up to my car. He says, how come you played like that? I've never seen anyone play like that. He says, if you play like that in a game, we'd win every one of them. I said, well, it's the last time I had to play for my favorite guy and drove off. Mm. And next year, they kicked three of us off the team. <laughs> well, yeah. now, this, this sports bit, now, in, in your, I, I mean, one, one area I'm always curious about is, uh, you know, the integration of the UB teachings in your life. And obviously, you know, uh, Sons of God as a, as a team name uh, is evidence of some kind of integration. Yeah. Well, that was it. It was like this, the Urantia book wasn't off to the side. It was like the main deal in my life. It was like I was, I was, it was like I had found a uh, manual to the universe that had these formulas in it that you could literally apply and they worked. That's what I loved about it. This so you did all work. Right, you did all these conferences, uh, and yes, and and involved now with uh, you know youth sports and things. I mean, is this what kind of time frame are we talking about now? Uh, you mean uh, uh, how how long ago was that in the past? Right, or yeah, uh, that was in gee, that was uh, the seventies, eighties, nineties. Okay, yeah, yeah, and then this all started falling apart all of a sudden. Everything fell apart. Mm. Everything within months. The team fell apart. I quickly, after they kicked the big horses off, Roger, Monty, and I, I quickly went down to Madrona School, got two more guys, got a team going again, and the first team we played was them. They came up to me and they said, well, listen, we're not going to use the name of uh, Sons of God anymore. How would you like to uh, uh, have RC Electronics? I go, yeah, right. <laughs> 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 well, they had another name, and uh, so we started uh, out with this new team, and the first team we played was them, and we kicked their butts. I don't know how we did it, but we did it, and I, I regret this to this day, but doggone it, I remember walking up to their bench, and their, hangs, their heads were hanging, and I laughed. I, I, hate, I hate to say it, but I did. I, I, I didn't laugh diversely. Just you know, it's like calling them fools, I guess. I don't know. I, I regret that in a way. But several people say, why'd you do that? And I'm just going, well, it just felt good. <laughs> I mean, I hurt. I couldn't sleep that night. I, you know, that was horrible. How, could, yeah. how dare they? Anyway, <laughs> beside the point, we uh, ended up all of a sudden, uh, what started it, I guess you could say, was Vern's messages. Oh, yeah. All during this time, Vern and Rose and Nancy and I were drawn closer and closer together. We would go down there almost uh, uh, periodically and visit them, and get they would come up here and to our conferences, and we were all in pretty good con communication and this and that. And, and we were working kind of in tandem together uh, at a distance, and I didn't know what was going to happen. All of a sudden, we drove up to Clayton at this time. Vern had bought in that beautiful place. It's this yeah. great big monastery that, uh, you know, he, uh, I walked in there, and he grabbed me, and he took me into a room with Rich Keeler. I remember Rich Keeler sitting yep. there in his pants, and uh, he was telling me, I have something important to tell you. And he told me that he had got a message that there's a real possibility that we will be preemptively striked by the, by the Soviet Union. Mm. And I went, oh... Well, I've been studying politics. I've always been kind of interested in it. And if he'd have told me there's going to be an asteroid that comes around from the sun and smashed into the Earth, I would have been skeptical. But this made sense to me. There was tension there. Wow. What what year was this? Like 80-something? 1983. 83. Fall of 83. September-ish, I would say. Okay. And so we, uh, I, I uh, took it to, to heart, and the message was simply prepare for it. You know, just, just just a heads up. That's all. It wasn't like anything else other than, hey, there's a storm coming. You know, batting down the hatches. That's about all. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone just totally freaked out eventually. We came back up, 
and kind of just told some people and got prepared and everything. And then it kind of died down. And then it just sort of, you know, everything kind of settled down for a while. And it didn't happen. And so, you know, there's some question about what happened. And it, what got me is you know, no one said, whoo, they had, you know, they, we got it, we, it was handled. Somehow it didn't happen. Yeah. But we would have survived. We were ready. I mean, we were ready. Well, about a year later or more, a second set of messages came down with a date. And then things went nuts. Wow. Bob Blackstock and Dana flew down in his Cessna and picked me up on the landing strip right behind our house here. There's a little landing really? strip. Really? Uh, yeah, a little <laughs> landing strip right here next to the uh, VIP. Mill. VIP David. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, we, I got in that Cessna. I worked at a, a airport when I was a boy, as a gas boy, and I knew what these Cessnas could do. And here I load all my gear in, got in, three big guys in there, and Bob pulls the old... Uh, mixture out, you know, the rod with a knob on it and gets that going. And I'm looking ahead at the furs at the end of that short runway. Oh, he takes off and that thing plane lumbers into the air and I look off the lip and there's Rose with a baby in her arms and two kids who are side on top of sawdust pile. And here come these pine trees and ooh, I just cleared it. Driving over Sacramento I'm thinking it's gone. Now we had the date. It was coming. And all these things they were talking about. They, they, well, they where, flew me. Where were you going? To down to Clayton to get the transmitter ready. The transmitter. I'd given, yeah, I'd given them a transmitter for uh, for for broadcasting on the on the amateur bands. And by the way, we set up the Brotherhood of Man Radio Network that, during that time. Incredible. Bruce Fierro and Incredible. Larry Jones and I. We had a network on forty meters already. The Brotherhood of Man. You know, we will we will keep in contact. You know, we had battery backups. Oh, we were ready. So I go down there, erect an antenna. There's a picture of me transmitting. On, and you know what? I got to tell you this. When we parked the plane and started to, started towards Clayton, <clears throat> they stopped and bought a six pack of beer. Good. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> That's good. Took the beer all the way back to Clayton. Okay. Each one of us had a bottle. <laughs> so I'm good with I that. I got the transmit. Oh man. Well. Then I, I went back, uh, came home, uh, and, and there was a the school district down here. I uh, dumped, uh, got a whole bunch of new equipment. They were dumping all this stuff. And it was like desks and lockers, cool stuff. I rented a U-Haul, threw a bunch of it in, and I put that transmitter in. This, is the, this was before uh, I flew down. And drove it to Clayton. And that was a weird trip. I mean, it was a weird. It was weird getting there because the place was in a total upheaval. I mean, really? it was a madhouse. Wow. Oh gosh, I could tell you stories you wouldn't. But things, people getting awful peculiar. I said, "Where's Vern? Where's Vern? Wow. Where's Vern?" Nobody knew where Vern was. I finally found him down in the basement, tuning in a radio. Mm. I walked down there, and you know, I want to hear something funny. One of the rumors was that Vern and I started this whole business because we want to sell tube radios. <laughs> <laughs> what would you call the company? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, what would you? Yeah, RF uh, a Glow. Because <laughs> you know, tube radios would be impervious to an uh, EMP pulse from a nuclear. Uh, uh, there you uh, go. Uh, can't yeah. Be too, can't be so, too careful. <laughs> yeah, he was down there tuning it. And I go, Vern, what about this date? He said, I know nothing about it. I wow. can't confirm or deny it. I know nothing. He was supremely depressed. Yeah, I bet. I mean, just down. Because it was a madhouse over his head. The place was just, wow, you know. too much, man. Too bad. It didn't It didn't happen. I went home on the night. Oh, I didn't get any sleep. I got dingy. It was, oh, it was a horrible period. I, the night of the of the blast supposed blast. I went down to shop downtown, unplugged all the equipment so it wouldn't get damaged, took what I can, could, the better stuff, put it in my car and drove it home for safekeeping because who knows if it can even get to town again. Wow. Where were you? You were, you were living nearby? Yes, I was living uh, in the same place here in Murphy and uh, I, we'd moved our business into town at this time. Oh. And we had like 20 employees, you know, in several locations. It just expanded. It just, just went nuts because we didn't have employees. They were they were guild. They were uh, we were a guild. Hmm. They got a percentage of every repair they did. They had them keys to the place. They, okay. you know, it, was, it was it was really cool. And so anyway, you can imagine the the uh, fallout and the feedback and all the well, one what, guy. Came. What were you feeling though? I mean, did you believe that uh, Vern was uh, picking up the right signals or what? He told me that 
these messages he was getting were on top of uh, on top of uh, Berkeley, where they lived there. Right, in Berkeley. but how did you feel about it? I felt they were genuine. Okay. I knew Vern. I looked him in the eye, and I could see, you know, he was he was. It was, I, I thought they were real. Just for one thing, the way they came down, it wasn't channeling. It was like, you know, it just uh, right. a voice came to him, crystal I mean, clear. I, I've heard that. Right. I, I, believe me. Well, you, were with, you were with the guy. I mean, that's that's a big difference, yeah. you know. You yeah, were with I mean, the I wasn't guy. with him when he heard this stuff or anything. No, but, but I mean, you were I, with him to talk about it, you know. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so we really didn't discuss whether it was real or not. We were discussing what we're going to do now. Right, right. And, you know, you did, can did, read all did about... Did he seem concerned? Was he... I mean, what was his... Oh, he was uh, extremely concerned. So he was... Uh, he was, he was I don't horrible. know if you've watched the movie uh, Starman, but there's a scene in there where he... Uh, uh, Jeff Bridges, he gets a little bit jumpy. <laughs> no, no, he wasn't jumpy. He said uh, He said to... to, to, the, to uh, I'm not sure if it was midwayers or what it was. He said, "Why me? Why don't you tell Reagan or Bagan, not the boy from Kansas?" <laughs> and they said, "Because you know who to tell." Yeah. Oh and man. He would, he would he would go up. He, he would he would he would he for weeks. I guess it was. He was just in turmoil turmoil Jeez. over this, and Jeez. he would go upstairs to meditate. And I I've been up there because I, I worked on that roof. Rod and I went down there and patched the roof for him one time. Mm. And there's a little ladder that goes up to a trap door. To get up on the roof, and he told me he would get to the point where he would go to that uh, trap the door, open it, and that the, as soon as he opened it, come burn, he'd shut it because <laughs> he didn't want to do it. Yeah, well, you he know, he didn't want to tell people that. That's well, not his mission. Hmm. This wasn't his deal. This yeah, is... he'd go up there. He'd imagine as soon as he opened it, the door, burn, <laughs> do it. <laughs> oh, oh wow, it destroyed him. It, it's they bad, it. man. It, 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 it's it bad. You know, I have, uh, you know, just as a personal thing, uh, I have tremendous respect and admiration uh, for Vern Grimsley. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we kept visiting him. We kept going down there. And uh, I got so upset, I wrote a whole novel about it. Really? Um, oh, yeah. <clears throat> Is oh that yeah, Spirit that, it, Is that something that's been it's published? A continuation of the Tales of Isaac. Oh yeah, it's, it's on my website there. Uh, it's 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 in just in disguise, you know. The the, the well, it's give, not. A, give, what's the URL to your website? Uh, well, there's uh, rcelectronics dot com. That will that's the main business. Okay. I have davidrclearwaters dot com, and okay. you can see them there. Okay. And uh, there, the I just got word back from my editor. On my fifth book in the series of the Tales of Isaac Midnight, and she said, "I can't put it down. I couldn't put it down. <laughs> your writing, your writing is getting really good. It's, uh, there's very few errors." I'm like, "What? I mean, she, the first novel, I bet you we passed back and forth twenty times. Yeah, you know, because it was my first writing. That's a whole other story. So to continue, so things collapsed here. Everything collapsed." The uh, Gold Beach store fell. Uh, Forest Service contract turned bad because of politics again in a weird way. And once a, you can t- can take years to build the business up, but once it starts, uh, the confidence is lost. It goes like a it just gone. And so I felt whipped. Came back here. Rose took out. A, we were heavily in debt. We were. Uh, people said we should have declared bankruptcy, but no, no way. We're gonna we're gonna gut this out. So Rose took a uh, signature loan, ten thousand dollars, and I built the best doggone calibration laboratory in Southern Oregon, possibly Oregon. Standards, uh, my uh, voltage standard, for example, is like a point oh 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 one percent accurate, most accurate standard available on the planet. And I calibrate equipment for a single man shop. <clears throat> my my boys work for me now. My grandsons are in there learning the ropes. And I'm having a time of my life. That's great. I came back here feeling I was whipped, Russ. I felt I had been crushed, whipped, and beat up. And about three weeks later, I'm sitting there going, well, this is great. This is wonderful. You know, God pushed me. Rose kept saying, you know, you, you pull the plug, pull the plug. And I hung on and hung on and hung on, you know, until God pulled the plug. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I, you know, I could say more and more about different things and all. Uh, but one interesting thing. <clears throat> Uh, I fell into extreme disfavor with Chicago. I couldn't get books. 
I uh, I remember when uh, the first electronic edition of a Urantia book came out. Oh yeah, like Christine Folio. And, yeah, the Folio DOS. And uh, later on, they were forming an electronic committee uh, to to come up with the uh, official version. And now, Russ, I, I was training hardware, but I, I learned to program in HTML, PHP, Java. Gosh, wrote our my whole database. Yeah, I do, I, I do all that. I do all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a language, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter. I said, Hey, I can do this. I can do that. I can do all these things. I, I'm a, you know. And they said no. Who said no? no? Uh, Chicago. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, now when was I'm that? Out. It was like. Uh, that was 2000? right when they started their electronic version, probably nineties. But what? 90s? But what connection did you have with them prior to that? Oh, I was a member at large. Yeah. Uh, Julia Fenderson. Yeah, I was a uh, member. Of, uh, I but I don't even know where my pin is. You but know, I mean, I'm Julia disgusted. Fenderson passed away. What? Probably eighties. Yes. But I had a connection into Chicago. Uh, Christy even wrote me a letter asking for me to investigate. Oh, I, the, I've met Christy. I'm happy to see Yeah, that. I sat next to her once. I never talked to her, but oh. she wrote me a letter <laughs> saying, would you please go investigate Ascendington? <laughs> now, this is a funny story. Go and ahead. Tell it. <laughs> Ascendington. Uh, that was in Eagle Point. It was a, t- it was a uh, kind of a farm out in the middle of nowhere where these guys... I'm not real clear on the exact names, but there was the Apostle Andrew and the Apostle Peter there, and the Eternal Son was supposed to show up Thursday. You know, all these, and it was like this this mixture of ontology, remember that one, and the Arantia book. And Joy Brandt was there at that time. And Christy asked me a letter to investigate it. Well, I'm going, yeah, right, I'm going to walk into a hippie commune incognito, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm just too, you know, I stand out like a, so I had a a, a, a very, very good friend, Terrell Watson, who uh, was a true, true hippie. He lived up in an A-frame built out of two by fours. He carried up on his back. They carried everything up there, water, you name it. I mean, this thing was like a quarter of a mile straight up to get to his his cabin. Well, anyway, I said, Terrell, would you go invest? He did. So he goes there. He's a cow to the front by the guard. He schmoozes his way in. They grab him, and they pull him into the SO, the spiritual office, and they start laying this big trip on him, how that uh, God is going to raise the earth up to paradise and, like essence, into, into the Father's nostrils. Yeah. And they're all putting this pressure on him. He can feel it. You know, they're, all, they're, they're trying to do him, you know, and he's sitting there, and he says, you mean to tell me, and he lays this rap on him right out of the Arantia book, hmm. that instead of the, 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 the ascension plan laid out by the... And, you know, he lays this all out, and it just completely stymies them, and he gets out. He jumps, uh, Joy Brandt somehow grabs him and gets him out of that, because he felt it was dangerous stuff, these, this psychic stuff. Mm. And he, he comes back, and he's, yep, it's bad. <laughs> so I wrote a report to, to Christy. So anyway, I, they kind of knew about me there. And so then, I just sent a then, letter saying, then the electronic I thing. have all these qualifications, I am uh, offering my services, no, because I stood by Vern. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, that was a tough time. That's why. That was a tough time, yeah. man. That was a very yeah. That was a very uh, divisional uh, thing that I uh, feel is unfortunate. Well, the thing that got me about it was we're supposed to minister to, to each other, share each other's burdens, not throw somebody under the bus for anything. Right. I mean, it's especially. I think it's especially uh, disappointing because, you know, it's um, you know the people, all the people involved, have a uh, pretty high level of faith and belief in the Orange Book, which is premised on the high teachings of of Jesus, which is you know. Uh, really, that God is love, and that everyone you see around you is your brother, and you know, if, if God loves you, you should love your brother the same way. I mean, and if you believe all that, yeah. if you believe all that stuff, then how in the world could you possibly exactly. could you possibly lower yourself to anything less than this kind of practicing? Uh, I mean, even if you don't love your brother like God loves your brother, I mean, if you, you know, that's pretty divine, right? But at least you could. Mm-hmm, yeah. But at least you could try. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kicking. 
<laughs> not destroy, not go behind his back and pull all the radio. I mean, good grief! You've heard those radio programs; they're golden. That guy, they, was, they killed the golden voice of the Arantia movement. Yeah, and all of us fell into a funk. No, I, all of us. well, I think the whole thing was very fortunate with Vern. I, I'm very uh, happy to hear of of this involvement that you had with that uh, with Vern and stuff. Uh, that's very fascinating to me. I mean, especially, oh, yeah. especially, you know, because, you know, uh, now that we know a bit of your, you know, how important electronics and, uh, you know, radio uh, transmission uh, has been for you, and I don't know, for me, it's it's a very interesting picture because, uh, you know, here we have Vern, <laughs> well, actually, the story you were telling is like, here's Vern, and it's like, you know, you're expecting, basically expecting the worst. And what do you need? Well, you need the same thing as the angels have, which is transmission power, you know. And, it happens, yeah. <laughs> and, and that happens to be your, you know, area of expertise. Yeah, forte. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was something. I'll tell you, it was. Uh, we, we made, I think I made a contact on that transmitter from Clayton to uh, Bruce Fierro, uh, and maybe Larry Jones for a test, you know. But we were ready. But. If, if you've ever uh, heard of Mark Kulicki and his book uh, Triumph in the Solitary Places, that, I haven't. That haven't. It. I haven't. Oh man, it's out of print. I uh, I have a copy. I, I'm, I'm going to try and get permission from them to maybe you know uh, reproduce it or something. But it it, it proves it. And, and Vern called me up in the middle. He says, "You're not going to believe this came out with a, ma- uh, a magazine. I think it was either Time or Newsweek that verif that proved it." And he says to me, he calls me up and he says. There's this article that verifies everything. He's, I've got to tell you now because I think if I wouldn't tell you now, when we got to heaven, you'd kick my ass. And I said, No, I'll come down right now and kick your ass if you wouldn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of rapport we had, you know. Right. There was no. That's cool. There was, there was just two brothers, That's you know, awesome. two, two random goofy brothers. Awesome. You know? <laughs> awesome. He was very goofy. He, 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 uh, he would try and do magic tricks for my kids, and my kids would see through him and call him. <laughs> see the look on his face. <laughs> we went down there. We went down there to patch his roof in that horrible place they have. It's not horrible. It's just run down. Yeah. And uh, we, he was, you know, we, 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 I, I said we were all standing there. I got a picture of the group there. It's something to see. I said that in front of everybody. I said, you know, uh, Vern loves to ride horses, but the last time uh, he had an accident, and he fell off, and his, his foot was caught in a stirrup. <laughs> And I said, and it kept, the horse kept going and going and going. I said, it has still been going until the guy from, my, from the uh, the manager Kmart came out, came out and unplugged it. He <laughs> 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 just seen the look on his face. <laughs> no, we had fun. You know, <clears throat> when we when we uh, vi- we visited him right up until they, he died here uh, a year ago or so, and I think uh, uh, it was just a couple of months before that, and. Uh, we just sit there and laugh, and, and, and there's no there's no angst, there's no hate, there's no. Well, let me ask it's just you a something, sadness. David. It's just sadness. Yeah, that's yeah, all. Yeah. Just sadness. But I, this yeah. This is uh, this kind of opens. There's something a little bit more I'd like to go in uh, with you with the ranch book, and uh, but this little yeah. uh, this little pause here with uh, Vern Grimsley. Um, you know, I mean it. In my mind, I mean, I love the guy so much, and I admire him so much, but there's so much I don't know about him. Um, uh-huh. And I'm just curious about, <clears throat> you know, after... Okay, let me explain how I see it. What I see is like, okay, he had whatever kind of communication he thought he had. And then uh-huh. and it was basically a prediction of certain things to happen. They didn't happen. His whole organization disintegrated. And... And you knew him after that, and and I mean, how do you? I mean, did he just? I know that it seems like some of the br- broadcasts were still going on, but I mean, basically, he must have felt very, um, I don't know, very sad and and dejected and confused. Yeah, he wasn't so confused; as just dejected, let down by his brothers. Yeah, his 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 whole. Life's work destroyed. Right, right. All those broadcasts right. pulled. Right, it's incredible. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. You know, and yeah, it's unbelievable. I, I'm sure he knew these things happened. Look but, at what but, happened. But how do you feel that he dealt with that? 
he retreat he withdrew he retreated he uh it wasn't like he complete you know he 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 reached he reached out to me i mean he reached out to to anyone who he felt comfortable with but no he 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 told me when he when he, when he finally compiled his his MP3s of a lot of his talks, and they gave me a copy of it, I said, "I'm going to put this on the net. I'm going to put this on." I started a, a right in the middle of this uh, collapse, or not in the middle of it, but afterwards, Zabro and I made connections again after all these years. Both of us battered, beat up warriors, you know, yep. isolated, lonely, cool. uh, misunderstood, the yeah, whole man. thing. Yeah, and man. He says to me, <laughs> he says, "We got to do something. We got to do something." And so we uh, we. Put on uh, the net your rancherresearch dot com, and I had that. <clears throat> I told Vern, I want to put your MP3s on that, and he said, Don't. I don't want my name to be associated with the Rancher papers in any way. Well, that's too bad. Because that well, they will be sullied. Oh, well, that's just uh, that's, that's just bad. terrible. Too bad. That is. So I put it on David R. Clearwaters and <laughs> everywhere else. And started uh, that 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 got got him out there, and of course now it, it's taken off and it's all over the place. But uh, that was the start of it, uh, getting him out there here on the Absolutely. net. Absolutely. Well, I'm totally into that. It's funny there there are. And you put those on. You put those on. Well, Remember that? That was wonderful. Well, what I did. Was... Look, I mean, what I did, and I think it's cool, and I'm happy to mention it because people it'll help people if they want to find some of these recordings. Is that Truthbook? Yeah. Book? Truthbook dot com t r u t h dot c o m dot com. Uh, <laughs> that yeah. site has all of Vern's. Uh, well, not all, but a huge collection of Vern's uh, recordings. What I did is when I got news that Vern had died, I said, "Well, you know, I am going." It was it was so cool. I mean, I feel real so good about it. I just said I'm going to post um, consecutively uh, from this day. Uh, all of Vern's recordings, one by one, as they are on Truthbook.com, um, until I finish. And I think I think there's like 190 of them or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a bunch, you know. And my God, that guy! Uh, most of those are mm-hmm. are 10 to they're less than 15 minutes. They're like 10 to 15 or 10 to 12 minute raps. And yeah, and that man. And his knowledge of the Arantia book, uh, coupled with his personality and his love for being a radio guy, I mean, my God, you know. I, you know, frankly, uh, I don't have much of a problem um, kind of imagining how Vern could get a little bit deluded with himself because he was so on to it. You know what I mean? It's like when, yes, it's yes. Like when you tune into something and you're picking up on it so hard, it's also easy to get... You know, uh, yes, it is. It, it's easy to get like, you know, I don't know, the ego or something about it. You know, um, I do. But the thing about Vern was he would uh, he was like a big kid. He was just like a big right, kid. right. He would right. He would I, make I totally a broadcast. See that. I see that totally. I, I would be there when he would finish a broadcast, right? And he would say, listen to this, listen to this. <laughs> and all these people, you know, they heard him a hundred million times, you know. And he, he would say, what do you think? What do you think? Was I okay? Did I sound okay? And all the people around, right. ah, you know, right. they heard it over and over and over. He was all excited. He gets all excited about stuff, right. you know. Right, But, yeah, he... Uh, I don't know. He, there's a, he was there's limits. To he that. first started off with a, on campus. He would go on I a Berkeley those. campus and talk to people those. about God. Oh my now, God, those are those so good tapes. Those tapes were sent up to me pre the deadline for safekeeping. We were the fallback place on the eve. Uh, lots of people moved up here on the property. We were housing a lot of people on that day, on that at that time. And there's a flat below my property that's on the river that the whole family of God would have moved to if times got that, if stuff got that bad. That was their exit strategy, to come up here on our property and set up camp on the flat by the river. So they were sending stuff up, seeds, you know, and and these tapes. And I'd forgotten about them. So then when, uh, uh, when was that? Well, I sent you some, some, I sent you some copies. Right. Uh, I found them again. I thought thought I'd misplaced them. And they're all reel-to-reels. And I thought, oh, man, they're all, you know, what's called uh, shed. They shed and they stick together and uh, ruins the tape. So they're fine. So I set Zabro up with a tape recorder, and we started m- making them, and we put them on, uh, on the site there. So 
there's some things that possibly uh, would have been lost if they wouldn't have uh, sent those up to us. Right. So those are awesome, those tapes. I mean, he's just talking to kids on campus about oh, God. Oh, those are so good. Yeah, they are. They're you so have to good. listen to them. You know, I could repeat them, but it's not worth it. It's, forget it. Listen to it. It's oh, great. Oh, they're so good. You know, it's yeah. so funny because, you know, every time I listen to those, I, I, I can see Vern in my mind, in, like with a video camera, with him with those, you know, the students of Berkeley at that time with their you know, styles and everything. You know, I could just see it all happening. Oh, yeah. I could just see. And he was so bold. He just, he would go, oh. he would just go out there and go, hi, what do you think about, yeah, you know, what do you think about God? <laughs> you know, it's like, what? Yeah. what? <laughs> I love it. It was so refreshing. His his spirit was so infectious in the movement. Totally. I mean, it was like it was like a no, it was driving the movement. There's nobody else uh, like Vern. Nobody. No. So far. No. So far. No. I think there will be, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's some allusion to the the John the Baptist and the Jesus uh, simile, you know. Right. So, David. Um, you know, at this point, maybe you know we. These things can go on and on and on. But I know. We ought to wrap this no. up. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not quite there, but I, I would like you to, you know, like, where are you at now with your ranch book? I mean, are you reading it every day, or do you don't need to read it? No. Um, no, I'm on my, uh, I, I don't know how many times I've read it. Mm -hmm. I know I've read it uh, straight through a number of times, but I've read part, you know, with all the study groups and all this stuff I read and on Facebook now, you read it all, every day. Right. I very seldom read it. What I decided to do was take the idea that there is this father fragment within me and all of us and contact it. Right. And that's what I do. I don't go to the papers to find, uh, uh, how would you say, sucre per se anymore. So, so you've already go got there. it. So you've based it. Yeah, you've got I, it. I, got the, I got that, and it's there. And uh, I got to tell you, it's kind of funny. I mean, I, I I'll lay my troubles out before God like a blanket, as G, on a blanket like Jesus suggested. And I have my little routine to do all this. You know, I usually walk in the morning, and uh, I can remember just all this trouble, all these things happening, and I'm all just push. You know, I mean, oh, how can this be? How can this be? What what's wrong? Blah, blah, blah. One word, crystal clear, normal. It's all normal. I was getting upset about normalcy. <laughs> this is normal. Mm. Yeah. So how how do you? Uh, I mean, has has the ranch book? Uh, I mean, what's the greatest way to change your your life? Uh, I guess it would be when I decided to put this stuff to the test. I was getting into the book. I was ready to throw everything I had into it, but I wanted proof. And I demanded proof. And I hammered on God's door in my, you know, in my own way. And I could tell you what happened, but it wouldn't make it to any, any sense to anyone but me. But it happened. And it proved to me that it's real. And when I was standing there looking at the visible proof which no one, you know, it's all personal. It is so personal. You Absolutely. Can't, what's that? Absolutely. I'm standing here and totally blown away, Russ. I'm just, my mind is just totally blasted. Mm. And and this voice says, you are a faith son. Mm. Don't ever ask for proof again. <laughs> yeah. No, what? That's what? nice. That's nice. Yeah, what are you? Okay. <laughs> I, I like answers like that because. Uh... Me too. It, it just fits. You know, it's like okay, but now what? <laughs> you mean I got to do something? Now, now is that well? Something, the whole thing is. Is that something you got recently or or? No, no. This was back in uh, when I was uh, just getting going. This was back probably in the. That's a good answer though, because I mean, I, I really, I really can uh, relate to that kind of. Yeah. You no, know, I mean. My, yeah. in my own person yeah. in my own personal experience i don't get a lot of direct messages from god but i don't either but when I, but, but when i do get a signal uh it's pretty uh pretty yeah, it's pretty, you know. it's pretty stout <laughs> yeah it's stout it's stark it's clear <laughs> <None>. <laughs> 
There's no question. Well, no, but because that, that's like a fundamental truth. I mean, uh, yeah. to me, a fundamental truth is is that, uh, you know, it's like, well, I'll give you one simple example. It's like, um, you know, asking, like saying, um, wow, it'd be so cool if, if Jesus could just, you know, give me some words and, you know, I'd really like some words from and then I had this flash one day. It's like, well, it's kind of like the Arantia book came along and gave you like a whole bunch of my words, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It it's was like, like, a, it's a, like I wanted that. And then it's just like, yeah, well, I gave you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's just it. The idea that this is a living, real thing that you can use and ex- experience in your life every day. And it's like, uh, it's not like you have to do the work. It's not like you're 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 trying to do good. You can't help it. You're, this this spirit within you it fills you with so much joy and happiness, and, and, and you can't keep it in. I can't. Right. I can't. I mean, I know, recently I, know. I have been giving Urantia books out of, out of my little shop, just like you can't believe no kidding. these people. No kidding. It's unbelievable. What I, kind of, I get them, uh... I get them used. Yeah. And I just, they come in, and I, 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 I approach them with it, and they accept it. Well, how do you do that? It's, it's, let's say, okay. I don't know how. Well, I don't well, know how. Say, That's I go, it. I come into your shop. I want to have my uh, yeah. my something calibrated. And I go, hey, dude. Okay. How, how's it going, David? Or how are you, how are you doing, Mr. Clearwaters? Uh, okay. He, let's say he's uh, he's brought in a, a, a speaker, let's say. Okay. Something that uh, people can relate to. Right, right. Say, uh, he's just a dude. Like, uh, he's just a farmer. <laughs> yeah. And I said, man, you know, I think melody, these melodies, why, uh, why do they excite us so? What, what, what kind of a common denominator is it that makes all of us like the same melodies? You know, and then just keep going and going. And if they're receptive, some people forget it. They're like a, you know, forget it. Right. Don't even, can't even talk right, about God. Right. There's no way. But others, you can kind of. So really. And one guy, yeah, and then suddenly you go, are you, would you be interested in the, yeah, and I give it to him. Here, read it. That's incredible. No, take it, go. So you're doing, you're doing <laughs> ministry right there and then, just, you don't care. Always have, yeah, yeah. Care. God, God's my partner, you know. <laughs> and it's like. <laughs> that's amazing, dude. What a guy. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's quite amazing. See, so your wife, uh. She's uh, what is she? totally. She's into this kind of thing. Oh yeah, oh yeah. She uh, she and I uh, we made a pact when we got together that uh, only one of us could get mad at a time. <laughs> Never ever belittle each other ever. And it, uh, you know, we probably only had two or three arguments of any con- uh, you know of any possible. One of them was on over ontology. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know we we never fight. We know, we always get along. Our kids have mentioned that many times. How it's amazing how we don't. How many? Don't uh, fight. How many kids do you have, David? Four. Oh my God, goodness! Now here's something I got. I got to tell you. I got to put this in real quick about my kids. Sure. I read in your answer book about uh, Jesus's positive instruction for raising children. Mm-hmm. Use the positive. Mm-hmm. Well, I had first started reading your answer book when our oldest daughter started acting up, and it happened to be when we were trying to put her to bed. And she wouldn't stay in bed. She kept popping up. Well, I spanked her. Mm-hmm. So she'd get up crying. Rose had spanked her. She'd get up crying. We both, I, got, I said, we're going to have to kill her. <laughs> this is not, this is not going to work. Forget it. Because my, my kids are headstrong. Uh, the they're first, all first very born, headstrong. Firstborn? Firstborn. Okay. Becky. Okay. And we were in a quandary. I didn't, we, I couldn't, I couldn't spank him. I couldn't touch, you know, I couldn't do that anymore. I just couldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I was wrong. I, it didn't work. Right. So Got it. one day, and I do believe it was when we were going to a conference in Oklahoma. We were traveling along. All four of them were in the back seat in our Volvo. It's a hundred and plus degrees. Everyone's hot, miserable, and they're fighting back there. And I've already wrenched both arms, reaching back and grabbing something and pulling on it. You know, and just reach back <laughs> and grab and pull on anything <laughs> to stop. And we'd stop and gotten some iced tea. And we're and they're rolling around back there, and Rose just out of pure, just when she threw the whole the the, the 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 whole iced tea on them, and they acted like she'd thrown hot coals on them. They just God, oh, it was the most horrible thing we'd ever done. And we looked at each other, and we go, aha! So we started watering them. <laughs> Typical scene. My youngest son uh, was acting up. 
And I would say to him, you better, you better tone down. I'm going to water you. He kept acting up, acting up. And I calmly go to the sink, get a cup, fill it to the brim with cold water, and march toward him. And he'd run into his bedroom and hide in his and crawl in his covers in the bed. <laughs> and I'd just march right up to him. And I'd say, well, this is, this is kind of dumb what you've done right here. And water him right in bed. Psh, water all over him. Water. He would get so mad. <laughs> he would get up. He would go to the kitchen and get the biggest cup in the cupboard and fill it to the brim and walk up to me and just splash me or splash me. And I just stand there dripping and go, "What's the big deal? Just water." He didn't even get madder. <laughs> That's very it interesting. Worked. That's very interesting. Yeah, it worked. They hate it. It's it's harmless. No, I know. It's, it's amazing. Uh, actually, it's one of the best ways, like to break up a cat fight or uh, something. You know. Yeah, dog fight. Yeah, yeah hose. And yeah, don't reach just, in. Just water. I mean, you know, <laughs> water. Yeah, well, yeah. well, there's there's a uh, a mark for you, David, because um, I don't think too many uh, parents have tried that one. I don't know why. I've even tried to tell my own kids, and they're reluctant to. I don't know why. Mm. I mean, there's nothing to it. I mean, the worst that happens is stuff gets wet. So where did where, where'd you get that one from? You just kind of came up with it? Rose, Rose uh, invented it. They're in the, with the iced tea. Yeah. When we're driving along in the just, heat of the day. and I, It's what, just like she saw I, it was very effective. <laughs> no, I think she did it out of desperation. There was nothing else left to do. <laughs> no, but she saw She's, when you know, she did it that it was very effective. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. When we heard their reaction, we both looked at each other. We went, aha, we got something here. Right. This, this, there's something here we can, we can you know, use, I wouldn't say against them, but, you know, uh, as a form of punishment that's harmless. So, David, I, so, I guess we could say that you know, gosh, your story, I mean, we'll have to probably have to do another one of these because, you know, you can only get so much in, in a oh, limited yeah, time, kind of time frame. But, I mean, you story. know, the Ranch book obviously has been an extremely important uh, influence in your life. I mean, absolutely. Um, I mean, yes. c- could you imagine your life without the Ranch book? I would have found some of the things <laughs> probably, but no, I'd have been, I'd have been confused. I'd have been... I, 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 I probably would have had just as many questions because the answer book, even though it answers a lot, it also opens up a lot. You know, you sure. have more questions. Sure. You, it answers one, but that causes two more questions to pop up. But no, I, I, uh, I don't know. I, from my past, before I read, I read it in the original book, I think, for me, I think, uh, I think I would have found out some of these things uh, on my own. Because the Bible does have a lot of stuff in it. You can just read through it. But I don't know. I, I'm just so glad I found it. And I'm so glad I, I, I didn't reject it, you know. <clears throat> I don't think I could have rejected it. It was too too pristine, too perfect. I mean, you read those sentences, and they're just like intellectual food. I mean, you can feel... I can feel my brain actually expanding after reading that book. Yeah. And, those, and the concepts sit there and molder in your... Well, not molder, but... You know, percolate, De- develop, in your brain. And, and bubble up. And, yeah, and, and and it takes time, and then here. all of a sudden, yeah. you'll be reading something in that first part, and click, 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 oh, four yeah. or five things click together, yeah, and this yeah. huge picture comes together, and you just, uh, I drop the book and just go, oh wow. Where where no. else could you, you know, get that stuff? You know, I mean, <laughs> nowhere. Because I've been looking and all the over the place. It is. I've been looking all over the place all my oh. life, you know, and. Uh, Never come close. You know, there's and the well, thing of it no, is, stuff <clears throat> comes close, but it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't go there. Not not, but they don't reveal all the way to paradise. Not as a package. You know, for me, I look at no. the ranch book as a package. You know, where it talks yeah. about it starts out with the the first paper about the universal father, and the last one is like you know the faith of Jesus and all the stuff in between. Can you imagine geologic oh, geologic oh, history? Yeah, uh, evolution of nebulas. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, you know, my God, uh, it, it, you know, uh, it's incredible. It's it just uh, it's great. Uh, electron, well, I mean, the ultimaton. Right. I mean, I think we're, you know, we're these podcasts. We're, you know, obviously the the main point is like I love hearing stories, and I think everybody loves hearing stories that are into the ranch book of, of how people discovered it, and then. You know, it's beyond that is, um, you know, what kind of role does it play in your life, you know, on a daily basis? Mm-hmm. And I like, I like, you know, in my own story, uh, basically I, you know, 
I think I did get to a point where I had read it enough where it was enough to to provide a foundation for my philosophy in life and my living of life. Uh, mm-hmm. I happened to pick it up again, and now I've been reading it cover to cover again, and I'm just like even more amazed. But that happens to be my personal trip, you know. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it, 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 yeah. Every time you read it, it, it it's, it's new again. It's it like, is. It's not new again, but it, it, it builds on itself, and there's. You know, it's so deep. What well, you could never understand it in one lifetime. I, I don't think we could even understand one section in one lifetime. <laughs> so what? Uh, the thing of it is. Yeah, go ahead. The thing of it is, real quick. Uh, the the book may be, possibly, the only revelation ever ever given mortals in an in inanimate form. Oh yeah. All the other times well, it's in a the... being. This is possible that this is the only time. And it's also uh, amazing that they revealed things that if our planet was normal, if Urantia was on a normal course, they wouldn't reveal it even to them. Mm. <clears throat> the uh, the levels of paradise aren't normally revealed until planets are much further in advancement than where we normally would be, right. let alone in our <clears throat> decrepit state here. Right. But yeah, that that book <clears throat> is just uh, it'll so, get you into trouble. <laughs> well, I, I like <laughs> I like what you were saying though about people coming in your shop and you have these. Uh, copies of it you just kind of pass them out oh <clears throat> there's just some i don't have it you know sitting out in the, i just I, it's on the shelf there it's not like it's right there in front where they have to walk around it <laughs> but yeah i had uh one of my technicians who oddly oddly enough was a, 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 a christian he was really something else he said to me one day he says dave you are either the luckiest man i have ever heard of or you know what you're doing <laughs> and they would say, why are all these unsavory types always hanging around? Why do you always get involved with these half-baked, whacked-out people? And I'm like, I don't know. But I just, but I deal with them, you know, and I, I, can, I, I, I don't know why that is. But I am, uh, especially on Facebook, with the uh, unsavory, you know, th- th- that's what Jesus came to, to, to deal with. Right. The confused, the hurting, the the, the, the bent, lost, the lost sheep, the bro- the lost, the brokenhearted, the floundering. Yeah. I mean, if you see a person drowning in a river, <clears throat> what what person wouldn't jump in and try and save them? Exactly. And here we're talking spiritual drowning. Well, that's true. What well, we free? We're gonna get a little wet on it, a little water on it, a little what crap on us? What? What's the worry here? Words? Gee. I mean, <laughs> I've been reading the Fox's Book of Martyrs. <laughs> we're a bunch of weaklings. We're a bunch of, compared to what those people went through, and they only had a slight inkling. I mean, man, if you read that book, it's just, those guys had guts. Those women, what they did to the women was unbelievable. And they didn't bend. They would sing. And they were, they were infused by the Spirit, and they could see it. Their, their accusers said to them, I don't know what this is, but the one thing they all have in common is they love each other, and they haven't even met. As they were putting him to death, and it wasn't always quick and easy. It took months sometimes, and they never broke. Can you imagine? Just to get it to here, just to get get this to us now. It's pretty amazing. Yep. So how dare us <laughs> drop the ball? How dare us? We can't. We won't. We'll keep carrying the uh, we'll keep carrying the water for Jesus. I'm telling you, it's it's too important, and, and it's it's so it's so rewarding and so thrilling. And you know, it's it's I don't know. It's <clears throat> it's kind of like uh, a tantalizing substance that is so desirable, like that pearl of great price, that you would do anything to draw closer to. And the thing that gets me is you draw closer to God. God whispers in your ear, I can't, I can't, I can't even tell you how much I want to, lo- how, how much I love you. Mm. you. You're not capable yet. I'm just itching to tell you how much. I can't wait to tell you more. But we're too small. We got to grow, you know. And this is going to go on forever. <laughs> I hope so. Just like our relationship now, you know, just like our relationship here, the the, the friendship we've been kindling. It's going to grow and grow and grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger forever. 
Well, that, Can you imagine? Well, that's the beauty of it. I mean, I, I would <laughs> yeah. I would expect nothing less of God. You know, I mean, I'm into fractals. Yeah. I'm into fractals, and fractals are an interesting uh, mathematic, I mean, very material world level uh, phenomena where you can basically, uh, in fractal geometry, you can uh, zoom in as far as you want, but the complexity never ends. And that's, ex- yes. and that's exactly, you know, uh, that is a little material pattern model of what God is all about in our journey through this uh, joy of discovering the truth, you know, that's what God is, yeah. is truth, you know, yeah, and, and, and there's, so, there's, there's so no rich. high, there's no high that's better than um, discovering truth as a personal experience, and the idea that this is something that can go on for uh, infinity is uh, yeah. is quite uh, encouraging <laughs> uh, to me, yeah, yeah, <laughs> because, you it know, I like getting too. high, you know, and like, I, re- yep. I really like getting high, and the best high I've ever had is discovering truth. And yep. and through the Arantia book, I've learned that this process uh, is something that is offered to us by God the Father uh, because it is uh, so wonderful. You know, getting high is, you know, I mean that's what God's all about, <laughs> and He's saying, yeah. and He's saying. I'm giving you an opportunity to have that kind of experience, uh, you know, 24-7 or however you want to divide it, but basically all the time, you know. It's like, yeah, that's very fascinating. That's an idea that the Ranch book presents. Well, I'll tell you, I, I want to say one thing, and then, and then I'd like you to, you know, if you'd like to say anything more, then you can have at it. Uh, but I recently I have been meeting a couple of times with a friend of mine who's a very, you know, uh, basically my age uh, and a fundamentalist Christian. And his, you know, position is, you know, he's he's still locked into these, uh, kind of the Bible, where you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Where the ranch book comes in is it's providing like an, another another signal. You know, these signals come in every few hundred years, thousand years, two thousand years, whatever. Uh-huh. And it's like it's there, you know, bang, you know, you got you know, my friend, he loves Jesus so much and I just kind of prayed and hoped that <clears throat> I was trying to I still trying to uh kind of direct him to somehow read the life and teachings of Jesus from the Orange book because he loves Jesus so much and to read that story I mean, really, man, from year oh. from year one. I mean, what he was doing yeah. in year ten, because my yeah. my friend is a biblical scholar, but he doesn't know about any of those years, and oh. uh, the story of the biographical uh, stories of each of the apostles. My God, you know, you look back into all of you know the biblical scholars and what they have to work with compared to that is. Those guys, if they could accept it, you know, if they could step out of their there's nothing but the Bible thing the mindset and accept, you know, wow, there actually were these guys midwayers recording this and this is the, the rap on this guy's life, the Joshua. My God, what a what a what a a blessing. Anyhow. Yeah. I wanted to say really? that really. I wanted to say that. <laughs> it sure is. I, I, I agree. Uh one thing about uh about the uh, Urantia book that Sadler, you know, he 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 was a psychiatrist, psychologist, and he, he what convinced him was he took the analysis of all the apostles as per the Urantia papers and presented it to his colleagues, not telling them I, I'm not sure about all of this, but uh, I'm not sure whether he told them where it was from or not. But they all agreed this couldn't have been written by a man or any group of men. I think, Their analysis. I think the story was is that even if all twelve or whatever it was of them tried to do that, they couldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they couldn't have uh, such a detailed analysis. They couldn't have, but, with all their psychological and psychiatric right. knowledge, they couldn't have yeah. uh, written such. Produced uh, it right. And here they were, leaders in their the field. Exactly. You know? <laughs> but what's interesting? I got to tell you, I have a lot of friends in my business that are atheists. You know, sure. most scientists are. Sure, sure. 
And what I find extremely interesting is I talk to them about God all the time. <laughs> and guess who brings it up? They do. They do. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And it, sure. I never argue with them, you know, uh, but they, I, I can see. i got to tell you, the Arantia book says the slightest flicker of faith, and they're in. Yeah, that's right. And there's that's one it. thing, I, and they won't bet me. Here's what's funny. I, I have this thing I came up with called Universe Credits. I made this up because of a uh, Urantia study group discussion we had where it came down we couldn't decide and so I said let's bet on it let's bet in universe credits that this is this way or that way and so when I bet my uh, atheistic friends that this is so this is funny one of them who was a millionaire and extremely lived up the road here extremely uh, uh, unhappy um, I've been I've known him for quite a while <clears throat> he was a uh, 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 philosopher and so forth, and we would be talking, and I always assumed he believed that there was an afterlife, and one day, it was in the summer, I mentioned it to him, and he said, there's no afterlife, and there's an ant crawling along the front walk of the shop there, and he walked over and smashed it, he said, we're just like that ant, we're dead, we're dead when we die, I went, oh, that's not, you know, and I said, well, you want me to put your money where your mouth is, and he says, what do you mean, I said, I'll bet you one million universe credits that there's an afterlife. He said, how's that going to work? I said, well, when we wake up, you owe me one million universe credits. He said, what if we don't? I said, I owe you. <laughs> exactly. He said, all right, I'll, I'll do it. He took one of my certificates of uh, calibration, an empty one, a nice, looks like a nice uh, document, and wrote it out. Only he wrote it out for one billion universe credits and signed it. Right. Russ, the next morning, he called me up and wanted me to tear it up. Mm. <laughs> That's a good one. And I said, no, no. I said, you might be rich here on this earth, but we, when we get into heaven, I'm going to own you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All a joke, you know? Well, but, David, i uh, got to take a, a little break here, about two minutes. Okay, I'll, well, right I'll, I'll roll it up with one last thing. No, no, no. I'm going to take a break and come back. Hold on. Okay, I'm back. All right. I took a break, too. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I mean, you know, hell, we went on for, like, uh, I think two hours. and uh, like Good grief. <laughs> so, David, um, you know, you really covered <clears throat> so many great stories. And, like, you know, at, uh, at your ancient age, uh, I'm sure you have many more. <laughs> um, but, you know, let's. I guess we should conclude this uh, podcast and... If, okay. And I think anybody listening to it, you know, they've heard uh, something about you, uh, something how the Ranch book has influenced your life. And I think, you know, it's your opportunity to kind of close this out with just saying, you know, uh, anything you'd like, you know, uh, about spiritual, uh, about the spiritual. I guess I could just add a, an angle on it is uh, uh, a comment about. Uh, the practice and belief in spirituality uh, in the modern times? Well, um, I find it to be natural. This whole business of relating to God uh, uh, through Jesus, through His His Spirit, is natural. It just feels natural. It's 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 a normal process. It's not anything earth shaking. It's it's. It's it's ingrained. It's like we're we're made for this. It's like it's just a missing piece, and when it fits, it, it feels it feels right. But uh, I guess I could wrap up what I would like to say by what uh, the last living apostle did, John. You know, according to the uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, the reason he was exiled on that island. This is all hearsay, not you know, not factual or whatever is they couldn't kill him. They tried to kill John, the, uh, apo the uh, apostle, several times, and they finally had to just banish him. But anyway, the point. When he was very old and uh, the gospel was, was spreading, he, he was very, very famous because he was the last living person who, uh, who supped and, and, and traveled with Jesus and one of the apostles. And so these huge gatherings would gather 
to hear it, to hear his words. You know, here he's been with Jesus. He must have some little insight, some secret stuff, you know. He could tell us what he looked, what it was like, what, you know, all, these, all this stuff. And um, they would have him up to the stage. He was so decrepit. And he would get up there, and they would just wait breathlessly on it, on his every, just waiting for whatever he was going to say. It would be so valuable. And all he would say was, my children love one another. And then right. they would help him back down off the stage. Right, right. I was at a Chicago conference once, and this is kind of a insight of potential problems with the movement. Uh, and I came out of a, a, a night get together. I think it was a wine and cheese party, and here were all the children of the uh, forum, all the all the youngsters, the kids from from the Chicago people. And I kind of hobnob with them and out there in the field. This is by the uh, Chicago Bears practice field, actually. That's where where we were camped. And the thing about that struck me was they were more interested in the phenomenon of the Arantia book, the stories about how it came down and all these nuances, not right. the Arantia book's message, but the book. Right. That's another problem, getting, getting letting the book get in way of the of its message. Sure. And that's easy to do because well, there is. are so many mysteries. An odd thing. Well, there. sure. You know, I mean, it's it's. There's no other book like it. I mean, there's. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, if you. It, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's like you know who you know. It's obvious that uh, people would have the first questions to be, well, who wrote it and where did it come from and all those kind of questions, mm-hmm. you know. But that's fine. I, I don't think that's a problem. I think, I don't know. One way of of, I mean, for me, the best way of of sharing the ranch book is quite simply living what the master taught, you know, forget the, yes. for, forget the book. <laughs> yeah. Don't even, you don't even need to mention the book. Vern never did. You know, Vern never mentioned it. Right. Look what he did. Right. You know, I mean, you don't even need you know, the ranch book, you know, no, I mean, if you, if you no. happen to be, if you happen to be, um, blessed with, uh, a kind of truth seeking curiosity and the ranch book, happens to come across your path and it happens to fit in with that curiosity man you are in my opinion a very lucky person but that is yes but yeah but that isn't really you know doesn't matter to me i mean to me i think there's plenty of truth seekers out there and people who have lived great lives of love who knew nothing and never practiced you know, knew nothing of the ranch book never practiced anything religious or anything i mean there's just people that are naturally tuned into those things because my god it's you know, all around us, we're infused with, you know, uh, various spirit influences, mindal influences and whatnot, you know. There's a lot of stuff going on for us, so that the Arantia book is not really, you know, a necessary thing. However, no. however, if you've been exposed to it and you've been ready for it, I mean, there's nothing more that you want to do than to share it. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> that's, that's, that is so true. But yeah, there's there's uh, agencies, you know, uh, uh, they go to unbelievable lengths to, to contact and any little glimmer, you know. The let's say you reject truth and and, and goodness, right? I don't want anything to do with truth. I don't want anything to do with goodness. <laughs> Let's cut it. Well, what about beauty? Yeah, right. Yeah, what about beauty? Right. You know, all you have to do is ah, beauty. Bing, you're in. You know, values. Say, values. Yeah, and I think no, uh, I, I, even, I, I, even the most, you know, even the most rabid. Uh, atheist uh has probably loved somebody and so how are you going exactly no. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah they're in <laughs> i think it takes a determined effort i'm uh, you know one slip if let's say you're determined not to go on the plan oh you you're, you're reject all the light you'd really have one to slip. work hard you'd really have oh to work i don't hard. think it can be done i don't think it can be done in one lifetime one slip <laughs> one faithful thought being you're in <laughs> No, you know, I, I it's all that. the goodness that's that. retained. Totally. Yeah. The problem is, you you don't want to get up there with some little wimpy, weaky, squeaky soul. You know, we I want to wake up kind of uh, big and uh, you know a, a little bit on the on the big side, not I'm not weak and small up there. You know, I don't want to I don't want to let my angels down. I don't want to let Jesus down. I don't think. Never so. let it be said that the the children of Michael couldn't handle this. <laughs> you know, we've got his we've got him to consider here too. You know, he's got people that are his brothers 
are saying, yeah, I wonder, going, yeah, yeah, how's your answer going? You know? How's that, that world of sin down I, there I don't, going? I don't think there's any, uh, you know, it, uh, what you just said there, uh, to jump into that, which is kind of a, a pretty far out thing that we can't really imagine, uh, these discussions among Emmanuel and uh, yeah. Michael and whatnot, but um, <laughs> I would feel, my feeling is that, hey, everything is totally, totally cool. I mean, yeah, totally cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's almost like a, a a carnival ride that scares you to death, but you love it. You know, well, there's like that, there's, that there's a part there's a part in the Arantia book where you know talking about the Lucifer rebellion and all that, where they, I forget what it is, but it's like we so and so, you know, or they so and so did a calculation that found out that in fact the whole thing, if you did the whole. Uh, analysis of it uh, there was more good out of it than there was bad out of it yes and i you know what i can see good in some of these evil people i can see good absolutely in some of the evil things absolutely. they do absolutely their music some of the music it's it's well they, something they, they, good. they are for people who are uh spiritually prepared to work with that kind of high energy you know yeah i mean if you're yeah. if you're at a lower level you know, that kind of, like, let's say you just, you know, basically, well, to be frank, let's say you have an asshole that's uh, causing trouble in your neighborhood, you know. You know, mm -hmm. if, for somebody that's not, like, spiritually advanced, I mean, that's just going to be a, a, an annoyance, you know, and uh, they don't mm -hmm. they don't have to deal with it. But then you have somebody in that same neighborhood who's, like, practicing higher spiritual beliefs, and they could see it as an opportunity to work on themselves. So it's really... Yeah, same situation, but different uh, ways of dealing with it, depending on your uh, level of achievement. You know. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, what you know. What gets me is how all the levels are integrated. There's no major jump. It just sort of it's just a smooth transition a lot of the time. There's occasional jumps, but how can all of the stuff be so integrated? has to come across as one experience. Oh, because that it just because blows it, me away. Because it comes from one father. Yeah. He's the pattern. That can hold all of this together. Totally. And make the experience <laughs> enjoyable for us. Well, I, I, mean, I, I hope you so. Have I hope so. But that's, <laughs> I don't think everybody, you know, that's the thing, though, David, is I don't think everybody's having a good ride, you know. No, they're not. You know. Because they're resisting. They're resisting. Well, I, no, I don't think it's just that. I, I think there are. I think there are levels of capacity and truth seeking. You know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That they uh, some of them just don't have the just, capacity. Just to, don't you know. have it. Just don't. Yeah. Just don't. Yeah. I, yeah. And then, definitely. And then, you, and, then you can... and then they don't have a good ride, and it's like you know, that's just the the kind of. A, there is the element of the roll of the dice uh, with yes, life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially with some of the hereditary exactly uh, exactly things that can exactly. just make your life miserable. But I think yeah. I think we could say that overall, though, we all have a pretty good shot. I mean, well, that and after we get on the other side, and all the negativity is gone, it's as if it never was. You know, all the bad stuff that happens here, we start afresh. I, I think after several lifetimes, mm -hmm. we're all going to be about the same. You know, it's not going to really matter. I do too. This beginning. I do too. So it's it's just uh, it's just a matter of well, it reminds me of uh, remember when the apostles would get all upset because Jesus was paying more attention or whatever to one of the, one of them, and Jesus <laughs> would tell them, "Hey, what's it matter to you? Oh you know, yeah, it's our relationship that's important. You and me, you and me, not me and him, me and him. It's you and me. <laughs> you know. Oh yeah. The relationship that should be between you and him, not worried about the relationship I have with him. Right. That's right. That's a that's a hard one for a lot of people to swallow sometimes. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's uh, after all, we are humans. <laughs> yeah, animals. I mean, yeah. you know, snapping, <laughs> snarling. <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, I got to tell you this. I don't know how many generations you would have to go back in the Clearwaters or the Zadrovich's family before we would have gone out. Strapped our, girt our loins with lead jock straps, put on our breastplates, armor, got our true sword, and rode into Chicago and <laughs> and fixed some stuff. <laughs> Gosh, I mean, yeah, no, you I, know what I mean. I do. Actually, I was um, tonight. I read the paper John the Baptist, and, and uh, it's a very touching story in the Orange Book. Yeah, and John, 
he uh, he really uh, related to Elijah, and so he uh, <laughs> he wore this uh, what they call in the Orange Book a hairy garment with like this leather yeah. girdle, you know. So he was yeah. kind of kind of what you were describing there, a little bit like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what gets me is Jesus didn't save him. Well, Jesus let him languish in the prison. Well, you know, like, he couldn't really. He just no. It because, was, you know, well, but, you know, I read that part tonight, uh, David, and uh-huh. and what was going on according to the authors of those papers, what was going on in Jesus' mind is that he knew what kind of honors that John would have after he died. Yep, that's right. So that was part of his, you know, not wanting to yep. get involved with that uh, situation, you know. I have a lot yeah. of questions about that, and maybe that's a good one for us to do another Oh, we could do on. this on. So, yes. so David, um, I think we can just conclude this uh, and and okay. put a. What I like to always say is put a bookmark uh, in it. And all right, <laughs> that sounds good to me. And you know, I really well, good. It's, I really. What do you think? It turned. We're, well, we're there, and um, you know what I like to do. Usually after a podcast, I'll probably uh, we'll just keep it open and then. Uh, we'll pick up the conversation, even though I'll cut it for our podcast. And uh, Okay, yeah, that sounds good. So uh, any of you who are listening, I, we hope you enjoyed this. This is a conversation between Russ McClay and uh, David Clearwaters. Uh, the topic uh, of this podcast is really about discovering the Ranch Book um, and the, uh, the influence it can have on one's life and a lot more than that. So... This concludes this podcast, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing the next one. Take care. Me too. Thank you, Russ. Okay. It's a great service you're doing. I think it's a wonderful thing. All right, David. Thanks again. All right. Talk to you later.